High Top Sports presents Daryl, as read by the author, Art Russ Jr. You know, the road to my life's second beginning began in California on January 26, 1990, and in lonely hours before dawn when my wife Lisa and I squared off for a fight in our bedroom. It seemed as if we'd been fighting for years. Actually, we had been. We'd been separated and reconciled so often I needed a scorecard to tell me whether I should go home or not. But this night was different from all the other nights because on this night, all my mistakes came to a head. Ten years' worth of drinking and club hopping and fighting and screwing around finally brought us to that early morning when those years would be suddenly topped by a moment of total stupidity. We'd always thought about my fooling around. We'd thought about my wife staying out late at night with her friends. Well, during the periods when we were separated, we she'd move back to California while I stayed at my house in New York. I'd spent my time with some very lovely women. I met women in scores of baseball cities around the country at night after the games, too. I didn't even remember their names, though they surely remembered mine. I tell myself now that when I think about the emotions I had back then, that it was the demons who blinded me, the wild spirits who had run amok in my life for the past 10 years. They had shown me some wild times and taken me on some strange adventures. I was living on their credit, the gold card of sin. But at 3 in the morning of January 26, 1990, they handed me the bill in a sudden and violent explosion. Lisa and I had been fighting a marathon on and off for two days, and that morning when she walked in just after three after having been out with her friends, we drew on our deepest reserves to pick up the battle where we had left off. Neither one of us would give an inch, and we traded abuse until both of us were bloody. Exactly what names we call each other in the winter darkness doesn't matter too much now. I only remember that the scene was ugly. I was angry at all women that night, but I directed my anger straight to Lisa. She brought it right back to me, and we fought like a cat. What did it matter, I said to myself, that I was a millionaire a few times over, that I had brought her and our children to the nicest seven-figure house in the West Valley, that I had brought my mother to the house of her dreams, too, that I had all the success in the world? What did it matter that as we kept on fighting up and down the stairs? I saw in Lisa's eyes that I was a failure as both a husband and a father. It was the same look I had seen in my mother's eyes when she fought with my father about his gambling on another terrible night almost 15 years earlier. We're living in a little bungalow of a house on 7th Avenue, Los Angeles' Crenshaw Boulevard District. I was 13 years old then, and now I was light years away from that bungalow. 27, a father myself, out of control just like my own daddy. Two days earlier, court-ordered blood tests and come back positive from the St. Louis Laboratory. woman I'd been intimate with, who was also named Lisa, Lisa Clayton, had declared that little Eugene Michael Strawberry, a child she had given birth to 18 months earlier, was mine. In order to settle it quietly, I paid her child support for a while, but then I stopped. She filed a paternity suit against me. At first, I had denied everything to the court, to my family, to myself, and even to little Eugene, but the blood test spoke for themselves. Now the New York press had gotten hold of it, and they were eating me alive. I don't remember exactly what my wife said before the violence began, because I was deaf and blind with fury. Maybe I should have listened more closely, but whatever it was, she said it again, only this time loud enough for half the block to hear. Suddenly, I was out of control. I, I cracked Lisa across the top of her head with a thudding punch that echoed through the whole house. She fell over backwards and then slowly got to her feet. We stood there, deep silence between us, rage and fear welling up in her, shame and guilt welling up in me. The demons around us danced with joy. Lisa had been humiliated in public by the press. Now she had been belted by her own husband, the cause of her humiliation. A quirking lower lip was puffy where I'd caught her with a heel of my hand as it came down. I'd hit her before, but this time she intended to fight back. She grabbed the metal rod from somewhere and whipped it with full force across my ribcage as if she was swinging a bat. I tried to block it with my hands, but, but the metal cracked across my wrist and sliced into my side. I, I doubled up at first, unable to catch my breath and afraid that she might have done some real damage. She started swinging it again or swiping at the ear as she came towards me. Then my own temper erupted, and before I could stop myself, I ran to the closet where I kept my 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. She ran after me. She's still swinging the rod and tried to force me to stay in the closet, jamming the rod into my chest. But I pulled my gun out of the closet and pointed it in her face as her mother, who had run up the bedroom, started screaming. My brain was on fire with evil voices. What did I say as she stood there ready to whack me again with that rod? I'm going to kill you, bitch. I'm going to blow your brains out. Go ahead, make my day. Did I scream more of the profanities we had been hurling at each other most of the night? Whatever it was, I said it was enough for Lisa's mother to call 911 and, to, and so doing open up the trap door as the very bottom of the pit. In I slid down the long chute, down and around the circles I whirled while what looked like a squadron of black and whites from the Los Angeles Police Department wheeled around the corner of Ventura Boulevard and made a beeline for my driveway. I heard a screeching of brakes and a loud banging on my front door before I even realized they had been called. Open up, police, they bellowed. They were already leaping and scrambling across my front yard and around the back of the house when I opened the door. They, then they were right in my eyeballs, hands on their guns, batons at ready, polite but relentless. 
Does this handgun belong to you, one of the officers asked, holding up my automatic with the tips of his fingers on the trigger guard like it was a piece of garbage? May I see the permit and registration for this handgun, please? Mr. Stroyberry, you are under arrest for the possession of a handgun. One of them said, I, I still couldn't believe it. This wasn't happening to me. This was a culmination of a thousand mistakes. I remember waiting, waiting to make phone calls to my lawyer, phone calls to my agent, Eric Goldschmidt, and to the Mets team psychiatrist, Dr. Alan Lanz. Was Lisa going to press criminal charges? Would I have a marriage left? I kept asking myself, how far down would I go? Was there any way to break this fall to pull myself up? The whole thing only took an hour, but it felt like it took all morning. I was formally charged with possession of an unregistered, unlicensed handgun. It was also clear from what Lisa was saying and how she was looking at me that she wasn't going to file criminal charges. The police weren't considering me a threat either. They were noting the incident as a domestic, and everybody seemed to be winking at one another when the question of Strawberry's drinking problem came up. Just be glad, I remember saying to myself as I tried to find something positive in this whole mess, that you aren't involved in drugs. It's okay to be an alcoholic. Something noble about it when you have lots of money. I posted $12,000 bail, and I was released. But more important, how serious I had been about the gun. It was loaded, you know. Would I have actually pulled the trigger? I'd gotten too close to the edge. I told myself I was hanging right over the cliff. I was sick. I was tired, but I was also very angry. Fortunately for me, the Mets had to put Dr. Lands on a West Coast flight as soon as they got the news that I had been arrested. I assumed I'd be talking to him anyway after the news of the blood test broke. I'd spoken to him on and off during the previous year and even had a picture of him in a locker with Deshea Stadium, but I was embarrassed about talking to him and, and joked around with the other team members about it. I knew I needed help even back in 88 and 89, especially 89, but I too was busy trying to be one of the guys who played hard baseball, drank hard liquor, and screwed around as if they had more life than they needed. But I was only fooling myself, and Doc Lands knew it. He came to the house later the day I returned from the police station, and we got to talking immediately. Doc Lands said he wanted to help to intervene medically in my life, but there was whatever we did, it had to be my decision. I can't force you to do anything, I remember him saying. You, you should stop drinking right here and now, but it has to be your decision or nothing will take. He assured me that we were talking about a medical problem, that whatever the public fallout was, he knew that I had problems that would respond to medical treatment. You're not going to get worse, he said. Uh, things will only get better if you let them. I'm here to make sure they do. Dr. Lance urged me to talk to Lisa. Things won't start getting better unless you go right to where you feel the most guilty right now, he said. So I confronted my wife, and this time, however, I told my ego to walk away, to chill out in another room and, and get out in from between me and my wife. I realized I had faced Lisa around the living room the afternoon after our fight that I had relied too much on pride. I was fed up with my life, I told Lisa, fed up to the point of needing to make a major change. I was a drunk, I said to her, a drunk and an adulterer. I finally broke down and cried, letting all the bad attitude and hatefulness that had been stored up in me gush right out. In those moments on that day, I wanted nothing more than to change my life for the better. I let other people and alcohol take control of my life. Now it was time for me to take it back. I couldn't stop crying. It was as if a kid inside me would have been lost for all those years was finally calling out for help. Dr. Lands and I are going to hold up for a few days, I said to Lisa, and we're going to sort this thing out. Lisa was in shock because she had never heard me open up and talk about myself that way. When we'd argue about something, we'd either have huge fights in which we'd blame each other for what was wrong and then become defensive, or I'd clam up in front of the TV or go on out with my friends. We had spoken honestly to each other for years. I guess we were both pretty young, but when we got married, I, I already had my career and more money than I needed. I met Lisa in 1983 at a Lakers game at the Forum when I was a local hero, a rookie big leaguer. I told the friends I was with that when I saw her in the crowd that I thought she was a knockout. We were introduced, began dating, and got married in 1985. Inside of a year, we had Darrell Jr., but I had already begun to let the pressures of being a baseball player get in the way of our marriage. I'd been taking our relationship for granted, and I didn't want domestic issues to get in the way of my career. And I was drinking. Lisa and I had been separated and reconciled twice, and during one of the most recent reconciliations, we had, we had a little dime in the coal. But the stories about our marital disputes, the divorce filings, and how my drinking was affecting my marriage had been front-page headlines for years. Now I hoped if I had to go into rehab, all that would change, and we could have a chance to become the family where my problems are talked out instead of fought out. If I had to go to the hospital, I said, then I'm going to go. Dr. Lands will check me in. He had been on the staff at Smithers, where he dealt almost exclusively with substance abuse before coming to the Mets. She said she was worried about me, and then she started to cry also. Dr. Lands and I checked into one of the hotels near Sepulveda Boulevard at Los Angeles International Airport Complex that afternoon, where we began talking in a way that let me say exactly what I'd been feeling for the past five years. He listened to me. I felt in that conversation as I'd felt in earlier meetings with him 
that I wasn't just an asset, a piece of property owned by the Mets and managed by Frank Cashin. I felt worthwhile, an experience I had not had in a long, long time. Dr. Lance told me that I was experiencing was a long-term reaction, that drinking may have been only a symptom of something else, he said, but I would have to recognize and admit that I was an alcoholic. At first, I was surprised. I, I didn't really know what an alcoholic was. I, I felt pretty ashamed, guilty, and humiliated. You have to get sober, he said, but he reminded me that it was nothing he could order me to do or prescribe. He suggested that I needed a break from the pressure that was building up around me again, even before spring training started. He said that I needed to get away from the world, from all the things in my life that had helped create this drinking spiral that had ent entrapped me so completely. What do I do, I asked him. A rehab, Smithers, he answered. I needed a power greater than myself, Dr. Lance said, to get that control back. Otherwise, no matter how many times I vowed to, to stop drinking, I wouldn't be addressing the problem. I was an addict, I had a disease, and I needed medical help. Well, going to Smithers, Dr. Land suggested, would also be a way for me to get a fresh look at life. You have to learn about yourself and the disease you have, he said. It isn't like you're getting over a cold. You're going to be an alcoholic for the rest of your life. Whether you're sober, dry, or drunk depends on what you do. It was my call whether to go to Smithers, and Alan Lands uh, helped me to see things in ways that made sense, but he left the actual decision up to me. The Mets management stood behind Dr. Lands. Uh, my lawyer spoke to the court who would be handling a reppin's charge against me and informed me then that I was an alcoholic and would be rechecking into Smithers in New York for rehab and medical treatment. The court came back with us with an offer to drop the charges if I successfully completed the program. Lease was not going to press criminal assault and weapons charges. The, the whole matter was simply going to go away. Why was I so lucky, I asked myself. In those series of discussions with Dr. Lenz, I began to get the sense that I was being looked out for and protected. It was only a feeling at that stage, nothing I could really pin down for a fact. I didn't know why I deserved any special attention. In fact, I felt pretty down on myself, guilty for what I had done and filled with remorse about how I led my life. But, but because I had said that I wanted to change my life, it was as if something had happened that day. Yes, you can. Was I special? Was all this happening because I was a great Daryl Strawberry of the New York Mets? One year later, I would get it. It would be revealed to me that uh, what changed my life, or rather, who changed my life, was uh, standing ready to change the life of anyone who came forward to ask. Asking was the key in being ready to accept the changes. I didn't know back in January of 1990 it would take another roller coaster ride to get me to see it. People who knew me said they could see the signs of alcoholism way before Dr. Lyons explained them to me. My performance had clearly started to suffer, and the New York press documented every break taking a, a moment of it. You know what I did about it? I had another drink, and then another drink to forget about the drink I had just had. That's what happens when you're an alcoholic. I drank my rum until I would fall asleep and forgot that I was drunk. Then I started blaming my family. I told myself that Lisa held the key to my problems, that maybe it was her fault, or my brother Ronnie's, or even my brother Michael's. My father, blame him. That's the ticket. The fault was never mine. My fuse got shorter and shorter. No one could tell me anything. Then I started turning violent. Alcohol does that to you. And I aimed that violence directly at Lisa. That was what lay behind our fight on January 26, 1990. On February 3rd, 1990, it was officially recovered. Recovery is like uh, never having to say you're sorry, at least until step five. Recovery is, however, always having to say you're an alcoholic. I learned that one spends the rest of one's life healing from addiction because once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. It's a disease, not a behavior, so you don't just get cured and walk away. You get sober by not drinking one day at a time and learn what it seems to stay sober each day of the rest of your life. You learn what it means to live with the disease of alcoholism by relying on a higher power to help you resist the chemical craving to drink. You also are taught that you should take a positive steps to remove yourself from the outside pressures that encourage you to drink. For me, that wasn't so easy. Rehab began with the attitude of easy does it and one day at a time. You're taught that you're not going to solve all your problems by yourself and certainly not all at the same time. You're taught that you have a life-threatening disease that affects not only you, but also your family and everyone with whom you're, you've come into contact with. That's why the 12-step program says you have not only have to take a searching moral inventory of your own life, but understand and accept where you've damaged the lives of others as well. At some point in your recovery, you're, you're asked to go back to the people you've hurt and make some sort of restitution. That's when you say, I'm sorry. I walked out of Smithers believing that at least the Mets were behind me and into a firestorm of negative press. I held a press conference and said, in effect, that don't beat me up because I'm not really a bad guy. I explained that I didn't know how to handle all the pressure of playing in New York and that I was a sick guy who was uh, getting better. I had hoped they would accept that. I, I had named to join Alcoholics Anonymous and was attending meetings. People there were speaking to me as if I were a human being and not some robot who played baseball. 
Maybe I should uh, just play ball and keep my mouth shut and not get into trouble anymore. You know, whatever exhilaration I was feeling when I was released from rehab quickly dissipated when I returned home to Los Angeles. I started thinking about the crushing weight of the Mets like a rush hour headache on a muggy 100-degree afternoon on a New York Monday in August. At the close of the disastrous 1989 season, Frank Cashin decided that he would not uh, reopen negotiations on the contract until the contract expired. No midterm extensions, he ruled. I, I was pissed off, but I decided to play out my ap- option year and let the Mets sit at the table with another team that was interested. But just as the spring training began, every Goldschmidt told me that the Mets had changed the rules and decided they did not want to reopen negotiations after all. Within 24 hours of returning home, my attitude did a 180. I was elated. It looked as though my decision to quit drinking and straighten my life out and the Mets' decision to go back to the bargaining table were somewhat related. Maybe the Mets had decided to make the uh, kind of long-term commitment that would keep me at uh, Shea for what I knew would be a prime of my career. I didn't expect that negotiations would go smoothly, but the Mets knew that I was looking for a five-year contract, somewhat in the neighborhood of what Don Mattingly was looking for and what Reggie Jackson was saying Jose Canseco should be getting from Oakland. I felt I deserved it. If you looked at my numbers, my stats were on the par overall with Mattingly's and Canseco's. They had higher batting averages, sure, but I had hit more home runs for over the past five years than Canseco had and also got more total bases. I believed I was a better fielder overall than Mattingly and Canseco, and I had a more powerful throwing arm. Through the early phase of negotiations, we tried to get the Mets front office to see things my way. I believed my home runs, total bases, and RBIs were in par with Mattingly, so I stuck to my position that I should have more than a simple one or two or three year contract. It was becoming apparent, though, that the Mets wanted to lowball us. That was okay, too. If they wanted to lowball, we'd play along, knowing that at some point in the season, they would have to improve their offer to see me to to go into the route of free agency. Well, half of me was secretly hoping at that time, however, that the Mets would let me go. After 1989 and the bruising I took from the management and from the press and the years of anger, I had admitted to myself my optimism about the Mets was dampened. I was ready to get my butt out of New York if I had to. The season started very slowly for us. As usual, I started off on the wrong foot in the eyes of the press and uh, the fans, but I refused to take the bait. If Cashin was going to fire salvos at me through the newspapers, more power to him. I would answer everything on the field with my bat. Unfortunately, I hadn't figured on Davey Johnson getting mixed signals from up front and then dropping what seemed to be all the blame for the team's early stumbling right on my shoulders. I was getting pretty pissed off at the way I was being made the scapegoat. There were other guys in the ball club who were contributing absolutely nothing to the team's performance. In fact, the team was in such a mess under Johnson's lack of leadership that guys were getting away with murder. But if I did one thing and miss, had one late practice, for example, he would find me and make it a public hanging. Later on in the season, I came to believe that Davey had been getting his signals directly from the front office. He had been my friend once in the minor leagues, and I was happy when the Mets brought him up in uh, 1984. But back in 84, I thought he would be the perfect manager, but he, he too seems gave away under the pressure of the big leagues. In Game 6 of the World Series, I still think he made a particularly stupid decision that didn't help the the, uh, team by taking me out, and it was personally directed at me. But there were times, even after 1986, when I considered him to be a friend. There were also times that he would fought with each other in public. However, in the early months of the 1990 season, it was as if he were deliberately looking out for a way to cripple my performance. There was no other reason for the kinds of statements he was making before and after each game. Things were bad enough on the ball club without Davies' reign of terror. The team played as if we were in a fog during the early part of the year. But whatever Frank Viola pitched, we won. Throughout April, Viola's pitching was a reason for our 500 ball. Viola's stats were incredible. By mid-May, right before we began our drive out of fourth place, Viola had a 7-0 record and 0.87 ERA and 52 strikeouts. He was enjoying the best start of any National League pitcher, but the team that should have been supporting him with their bats and their feeling was simply in another world, another era. My own personal highlight came at the beginning of the May when Reggie Jackson announced that he had taken on Oakland's Jose Canseco as his personal project. My eyebrows went all the way over the top of my head and down on my backbone when Reggie said there were no other players in Canseco's class except for one, Daryl Strawberry. Reggie, Reggie, Reggie. I'll vote for that. Thank you, Reggie. Well, clearly Mr. Jackson's interview couldn't have made Frank Cash and his bow tie very happy, but it certainly got the New York press to sit up and take notice. Suddenly, Darrell's being in the option year took on greater import, as did the fortunes of the stumbling, bumbling New York Mets. We were so hapless that we tripped ourselves up in almost every game, every contest. In one particularly embarrassing incident, poor frustrated Dave Cohn got so mad at the first base ump over a call 
while two runners were standing on base that he romped, uh, stomped over to argue with the umpire without calling a timeout, and Dale Murphy skipped home from second. The umpire, Charlie Williams, was in shock. The fans hooted and howled, and Davy Johnson just sighed in disgust. When Williams suggested to Cone that he might want to think about the other runner still on base, Davy became so furious that he argued even harder. Meanwhile, a second runner danced home. Part of me simply wanted to shoot Dave Cone on the spot to put him out of his misery. It was getting downright scary. I knew what was in the wind when the press began saying that I was behind the fall of the Mets. Hey, forget the fact that Dave Cohn stood there bellowing at Charlie Williams while two runs pirouetted home. It's, it's Darrell's fault. Forget Davey Johnson's or Ralph Cramden G. Alice expression as Hojo groped for balls sailing over his head. And forget that we had to trot out a guide dog to the mound during warm-ups to show Ron Darling where the plate was. It was all Darrell's fault. You see, according to Dave Anderson in the Times, Darrell was getting special treatment from one and all because he'd slapped around his wife, pointed a gun at her head, told her to go ahead and make his day, gotten all off to the pokey, and then took the cure. Was this the new front office party line that was showing up in Henderson's column? Anderson finally spelled it out for the Mets, a worthy Mets spelling out their negotiating position for him because Davey Johnson was already effectively brain dead. That strawberry was not only not worth the $3 million a year he'd probably be asking for, but not worth the 1.8 mil he was currently getting. Did the voice of Frank Cashin have any more brilliant than original insights? He sure did. Get me going or trade me away. I was nearly as valuable as Jose Canseco. Take that, Reggie. Or even Bo Jackson. Even Bo knows that. Did a building have to fall on my head or what? Dave Anderson had spoken. So let it be written. So let it be done. Earth to strawberry. Frank's made his decision. All he doesn't have the guts to sit down and talk to you about it. That's what I believed. Also, there were so few black players in the team as it was. I felt as if they were... I was playing baseball at Dred Scott Memorial Park in glorious downtown Johannesburg instead of the middle of New York City. Then on May 29, the thunder and lightning struck. Frank Cashin actually spoke to us and called us a bunch of underachievers. His physically speaking to us was in itself a kind of event. I brought a camera. He said we didn't have any fire in our bellies. Actually, most of us had heartburn from what we've been through the last uh, six weeks. You knew your team was in trouble when you could picture Ron Darling chewing Rolaids instead of chewing tobacco on the mound. I myself had given up uh, booze for my lanta. Then Cashin said our problems of the past were now over because we were getting a new manager. He had dismissed Davey Johnson, who was the winningest manager we ever had, and replaced him with third base coach Buddy Harrelson. Frank had finally had his revenge on Davey. Frank, it was said, had had it for uh, Johnson even during the early years of 1984 and 1985. One side of me said that I wasn't angry that uh, Davey was fired, but the way it was done. After all the things he had been through together, and despite our public disputes, I had through all this time rely on him as a friend. Part of me said total bull and that I should stop being conflicted by stuff. By June, I was hitting safely in most of our games and realized that I was on the upward swing of a curve. I was entering the flow and walking on air. The Mets and I had started our winning streaks. You could hear the groundswell starting to build. We were seven or so games out at first, but matching Pittsburgh win for win. There was a downside to this, too. It was like the Mets refused to play division-winning ball until I started hitting. They had to wait for me to start before they came together as a team. I thought I was ready to accept the responsibility when it came because it meant two related things, both of which were purely business. First, we had a shot at the pennant after all, and I believe that I could show the way. Second, Frank Cashin would have to realize that I was a driving force behind the team, whether I was a leader or not. He'd have to see that uh, even if I had been a blind spot there where I was concerned. I began ripping the ball in the outfield even when I didn't hit home runs. There were shots that I had hit that were too hot to handle. Even the fielders got the glove on the ball. And when the ball flew, it flew into the upper deck so hard that you could hear the crack of the shot all the way out in the parking lot. I wanted to strap hangers on the number seven train, the one you take the shade to know that every time I hit a home run and to feel good about it. I had another agenda as well. I figured that if the Mets wouldn't negotiate seriously, then I would literally hit myself out of the Mets and onto another ball club. I was still pretty conflicted, but remember, we're talking about professional baseball and just couldn't clean out my desk and go to another company across the town. I had to go through a whole process of negotiation, filing for free agency, waiting for the Mets to make a final offer, and then opening up negotiations with other clubs. But I still had to go through the entire season to play baseball with an eye to either having the Mets meet our contract demands or making myself valuable to another club should the Mets decide not to meet them. It's not at all as straightforward as, as it seemed. In either event, I would go out strong. I told myself, even as I tried to show the Mets, that I could still contribute to the ball club. 
We were contenders again, playing the way we had in 1986 and 1987, making situations happen and stealing what they wouldn't give up. We were playing like the first division ball club we really were, and we kept looking at the box scores every day as we lopped off the games that separated us from the Pirates. Soon they would be ours. Before long, we were only three games out of first place and on the march. The next night, I belted a 430-foot home run off the billboard in uh, right center, and we were only two and a half games out. A day or so later, the other shoe I was waiting for finally dropped in the business of professional baseball. Jose Canseco made history. On June 27th, right in the middle of our 18-game hitting streak and the Mets climb into first place, Jose Canseco got $23.5 million five-year contract from Oakland. My appetite was whetted. By the end of the first week of July, I was among the top 10 batters in the National League. I had the highest ratio of RBIs to games played at any point in my career, and I was hitting pitches all over the field. I was positively ripping the ball apart. I was determined, seething at pitches who tried to take chances away from me and completely focused on baseball. The free agent contract negotiations were just another arena in which to compete, and I wanted to come out on top. Frank Cashin, though, didn't budge from his original position. I simply wasn't worth it. Interpret that any way you want to, boys, he said. Oh, he restated it corporately, of course, slamming the door shut on future negotiations uh, during the remainder of the season, but holding out the possibility of a resumption after I had formally filed my pre agency papers at the end of the season. He covered his position by holding open the door just a crack so he could, wouldn't automatically waive his 15 day exclusivity uh, period after I officially became a free agent. That he must have assumed would to keep everybody away while he watched me twist slowly in the wind. It was nothing less than a public hanging the check off for Eric Goldschmidt and put me in a weakened position for the rest of the season. I put down the newspapers with a feeling of letdown and relief. At last, the waiting and tension were over. At least I knew where I stood. I think I cried a little, too, because I knew that a 10-year relationship with my adopted city was over. We still had about half the baseball season left to play, and it was just about tied with Pittsburgh for first place. I tried as hard as I could to whip up enthusiasm for getting back in that batter's box that afternoon and swinging for the fences. I tried not to feel like a big, dumb, stupid fool who was the laughing stock of the whole country, not to mention New York City. Suddenly, the baseball season and our uh, pennant race didn't seem fun anymore. The rest of the season is history. No, we didn't win our division. Pittsburgh went on to win. Los Angeles didn't win the West either. Cincinnati went on to win. In an unbelievable World Series, Sweet Lou banished from New York by George Steinbrenner manages his Reds to a total domination of the Oakland A's with a four-game sweep. The World Series will go into the books. The Mets might have been glorious 1990 season went into the books, too. Around about the end of October, the Mets did what they had to do. They, they made me their offer. Frank was a little bit kinder this time. He said that he never meant to insult me personally when he said that I wasn't worth $5 million. He said he felt no player, not even Jose Canseco, was worth $5 million. Maybe if he'd said that in July, things might have been different. The Mets tended an offer of about $50 million to Eric Goshman, who did not extend to five years. Frank Cashin told Eric that in order to save time and put the bad feelings behind us, this would be the only offer he would tender. Don't even bother to counter, he said. This is it. If you reject it, Daryl's gone. We rejected it. Then Fred Clare from the Dodgers began talking to Eric in Los Angeles about a five-year package. It was happening. The dream that I might go home and to play baseball was becoming a reality. Eric and Fred talked a few more times, and I got a late-night phone call that they had agreed to a five-year package of more than $20 million. Before I left for good, I saw Doc in the Mets clubhouse. You're gone, Doc said. There was a sadness in his voice, and both of us were teary. He was my closest friend on the Mets, and I will always love Dwight Gooden. From the way they treated you, he told me, I don't know how you put up with it. We hugged. I left. It was over. I flew to Los Angeles where I put on my Dodge uniform for the first time for the press and announced that I would play in Los Angeles for the 1991 season. Glory. I had been brought home. I would play in that stadium that I had thought about and dreamt about from the first time that I heard the word baseball. I had spent the previous 10 years getting used to an insanity I'd actually learned to like. Life in New York City. A New York lifestyle is difficult, but once you adjust to it, being out of it for a long time can give you a case of emotional bends. I know that my depressurization was a uh, reason for the violence on the night of January 26th when I was arrested. There's a kill or be killed attitude in New York that is unnerving to anybody who hasn't learned to deal with it. Try to catch a taxi in midtown Manhattan at 1230 in the afternoon and stay a civilized human being afterward. These are all parts of living in New York that I'd actually gotten to know and love. 
you know, I, I had grown up in Los Angeles, but I'd become a New Yorker. New York and Los Angeles were as different as any two American cities can be. In New York, people live up, not out. Apartment buildings stretch to 25, 35, 50, 75 stories with high-speed express elevators and rooftop athletic clubs. You know, you can live in a penthouse so high above Manhattan that on certain days in October and November, you can barely see the street through the fog and the drizzle. Just getting to the first floor on certain mornings may add 50 minutes to your commute to work. And New York is always, always, always crowded and wet and dark, and you can learn to live with all of it if so you wish you were back when you're not there. But that's not Los Angeles. When New York goes up, Los Angeles spreads out. But there's definitely one similarity. Like New York, Los Angeles is a city of ethnic neighborhoods marked by delicate cultural balances and the red lines and a real estate agent's Thomas Guide. If you're black or Latino, you get to know those red lines real well. You think maybe someday you'll break into the public light and red lines will disappear for you. But they won't for your parents or for your friends and just for you because you're special. You can hit a baseball so far that no one can see to where it falls. And when you were 10 or 11, someone said that someday you'd be a professional athlete. And at the very least, you'd make more money in a single season than most of your people in your neighborhood would see in a lifetime. And that made you special. It put a responsibility on your shoulders that uh, whatever you accomplished, you accomplished for everybody else as well as yourself. The red lines would disappear for you someday, but there would still be a set of invisible lines as thick as prison bars. No one would see them but you. No one would acknowledge them, not even you, but they'd be there all the same between you and the rest of the world. And all of this, the promise, the responsibility, and the pressure to represent your entire neighborhood would happen when you were only 10. Now I was back in Los Angeles and I could see the red lines and feel the prison bars. I could see my past laid out on a map every time I drove along Mulholland Overlook and peered down the mountain to the city of Los Angeles spread out below me. As you wind along the Mulholland Ridge, you, you, you cross the canyon roads that take you from the valley to the basin. And if you head east from the ocean, you'll eventually come to my old Crenshaw Boulevard neighborhood on the western edge of downtown Los Angeles. The signs will say Crenshaw District as you drive south and east into the heart of the neighborhood along Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. We lived in a tiny green stucco house right on 7th Avenue near where the Harbor Freeway cuts east from the Pacific Highway in Santa Monica to downtown Los Angeles. The freeway was like a railroad, but all we knew of it was it was a small stretch that bounded the little dirt baseball fields in our neighborhood where uh, my father sometimes played baseball. I learned to play ball in those fields by watching my father and older brothers play. When I was nine and ten, those fields were more my home than the house itself. Sometimes on Saturday mornings, our father would take my brothers Michael and Ronnie and me with him to Manchester Park, where we would play in a local baseball league. Our father, Henry, worked for the post office, played for the post office in the league, and was a popular local athletic figure. He was a good-looking guy, tall and thin, and he would hit a ball farther than anybody else in his ball team. He was a softball pitcher who could whip the ball across the plate so fast you wouldn't know where to uh, start your swing. Nobody hit my father when he was on the mound. Nobody. He was also a football player, a quarterback who could not only thread the needle to his receivers through tight coverage, but run the ball full out off a keeper, get up after a brutal hit, and throw a pass on the very, very next play. Like all great backs, Henry had a way of looking one way and cutting another so smoothly that even when Tacklers got a hand on him, he'd shake them like a snake twisting out of its skin. And when he twisted out of our lives, he shook us like skin too. We tried to wrap ourselves around the emptiness of where our father had been, but uh, there was no way to grab. He was there and then he was gone, and we had only had the memories to mark the place he'd occupied. He was on to other things, and we were left to fill in the empty space. Maybe, maybe I felt it more. Maybe I was more impressionable. I'll never really know, but it seemed as if uh, his leaving had the greatest impact on me. I think my little sisters might have been too young to feel the blows, and Michael, my oldest brother, seemed to step into the role of a father in my life. Ronnie and I seemed to pair off, and I followed him wherever he went. But, but I remember being left with a well of anger so deep that even today it seems utterly bottomless. It's like a, a gaping chasm in my life that I'm afraid to look into, uh, fearing that it will suck me in and, and I'll never escape alive. I, I can't fill that chasm, although I've certainly tried. I throw my own talents into the pit and toss in people I've loved, friends and teammates and family, everything, but it is all consuming. Nothing fills it up. I, I've thrown liquor into the pit, using it to fill the void, drinking until I was so sick I, I couldn't stand up without help. I've screwed myself silly to fill the emptiness, but that didn't work either. Then I threw in love and sacrificing it, tossing it in anybody who ever lent me a helping hand. 
As soon as they pulled back those hands, even to scratch their heads, I, I took it as a sign of disloyalty and, and then went into a pit. Now, Davy Johnson was in the pit. Buddy Harrelson was in the pit. And by sacrificing them, part of me hoped maybe it would ease the pain of my father sacrificing me. Or did I sacrifice him? But that didn't work either. Nothing worked, and the pit is still there, still as bottomless and destructive as ever before. Daddy was a gambler. It wasn't pretty, and there was nothing romantic about it, especially because nobody ever taught him when to hold him or where to fold him. He just bet because when he was betting, he thought he was alive. Addicts aren't characters or eccentrics. They're, they're downright ugly. I'm an alcoholic, and I know it. When you have an addict in the household, the entire family tends to form around him and make sacrifices to support his needs. My daddy's needs were all about money. Somehow, my, the harder everybody worked for it, the more it was gone and the less the family had. There were five of us in the house, and we always had to worry about there not being enough food to go around when Daddy was on the gambling bench. Worse, my mother Ruby worked for Pacific Bell, where she made a good salary, but we were always warning for money because Daddy was always betting a farm every time he had a farm to bet. My Daddy wasn't much of a companion even when he was around. I know I'm angry about it to this very, very day. When one of our parents is an addict, you, you don't get the complete parent package. They take something out of it at the factory. There's always a part of that person more committed to the addiction than committed to taking care of yourself. When you're a little kid and your sense of self is still dependent upon what your parents puts into you, you, you tend to believe you're not important or you don't really exist. And that makes you mad because you know you do exist. My father began spending very little time with the family after I turned 11. He'd be drunk a lots of times and would not even know what he was saying. He'd be abusive and menacing and threatening Ruby, threatening us, threatening the way we lived. Henry was chewing through money as fast as he got it. The more you gave him, the more he blew. Ruby had to call a stop to it. She'd lived through it long enough, but it was coming to a choice between keeping a family in their house and keeping Henry in betting money. You could hear him screaming that he worked for it and he could spend it. And you could hear her saying that any man who let his children want for food and the good things in life just to bet on a horse and whatever else was less than a man. Well, Henry couldn't take being called less than a man, even though he knew he was less than a father. It was his family, he kept saying, his family that was keeping him from realizing his dream. What was his dream? Winning a trifecta? His own family was keeping him in change, he said, locking him in responsibility. Think how wonderful it feels to hear that at night as you, you're drifting off to sleep. On one particularly hateful night, I remember Henry had come home very late and very drunk and started complaining about his family. Family? My mother shot back. What do you mean, family? She'd be really mad that he'd never spent time with us for, uh, with her. He was always out, always gambling, always drinking. What kind of father is that? That is what my mother told him, and time after time, and on this one night, he, she must have just gotten to him. Maybe Henry said that he wanted to kill all of us. At least that's what I think it sounded like. You know, children tend to block out those kinds of threats, especially when they're made by someone who's never seemed too thrilled that you're alive in the first place. Ruby answered him, but we could hear fear in her voice. I say we because I knew my older brother, Michael, who was 15, was already in the kitchen. We all got up to watch this one. I remember thinking this wasn't like one of the hundreds of other fights they've had. This one was dangerous. I was afraid because as rocky as it was, my life was still held together by two parents, both of whom worked, both of whom were together in the house some, if not all of the time. As my father drew closer to my mother and hissed at the rest of us with greater and greater anger, we could smell the alcohol in his breath. He was a fearsome sight, all licked up and mean like he hated us, but he was also hating himself. He was weaving, kind of staggering, but all the more menacing because you knew he was speaking a version of the real truth, even though it was increased, shall we say, by the liquor. It was when he said that he would start hurting us that my brother Michael stepped in. Michael spoke back and you could see my father turning in his direction and raising one of his very dangerous eyebrows. I didn't like this. My knees were knocking because this was bigger than anything I've ever seen. Things were spinning out of control and the conf confrontation was, was drilling through the bedrock of my life. Somebody, anybody, help. My father took a few steps towards his oldest son, glaring down at him not just as an opponent, but as a, someone challenging his leadership of the tribe. You get out, Michael bellowed in a voice so artificially bass you could feel the vibrations along the way along the fault line to San Dimas. You get out of our lives. I was in shock. Michael was throwing his father, my father, out of the house. Say what, my father said, bawling with his fist as if the whole kitchen was going to explode into violence all over Michael. You leave us alone, Michael screamed. Just get out. He was trying to be a man, but he was only 15, and there were tears in his eyes as well as in his voice. I didn't care who you are. You'd rather roll over and die than inflict pain on your father, even though you hated his guts. Just get out. But my father didn't seem to have any reservations about hurting Michael as he moved towards him as if he weren't his son, but just another person he wanted to beat up. He wasn't my father at that point. He was an assailant. 
That scared me. This was no dream. My 14-year-old brother, Ronnie, was scared, too, but he, he couldn't stand back and let Michael get beaten up. He, he challenged my father also, telling him that he would protect his brother. I broke out into a cold sweat, and for sure, I think my tongue was actually stuck to the top of my mouth. Me, too. I think I, I said I stepped up behind my brother, Ronnie. I could feel the blood pounding behind my eyes and right below the base of my skull. I could feel my throat close up all the way down to my lungs. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't think. I was almost paralyzed by fear, but it wasn't a fear of my father that was wrenching through my muscles like an electric current. It was a fear of myself. I was cutting myself off, challenging my father on a violent, physical, primal level of combat that was leading straight to the unknown. Worse, I was suddenly in a universe where I should not be. Your father, your blood does not turn against you. I was in a world where my father would turn his violence on his eldest son and would have hurt all of us. I felt like he might have killed us. It was just moments away. But we stood firm. Then he backed down. As our father disappeared into the night, we still stood there in the kitchen, Michael puffing himself at the, of having successfully challenged the old man, Ronnie and I staring at each other wide-eyed, not knowing yet how serious things were. Maybe we managed to laugh from the relief of the tension afterward, but I, I don't think so. I think we were more afraid of what was about to happen than of what had just taken place. We knew that we weren't the same family anymore and that all of us had changed, but what did it mean? A couple of nights later, Henry returned and sat at the kitchen table with my mother. This time he was sober and we weren't allowed in the kitchen while they talked. Our mother was trying as best as she could to set things right, to put us back in our places as children. She felt as bad about it as we did. Bad isn't even the right word. Sickened is the better. My mother told him that whatever happened was directly a result of his gambling and drinking. He was destroying us, she said. He was destroying his children. If you don't want to have a family, then you won't have one, she said. She told him she wanted a divorce and that she would make sure he left us alone. Well, when she finished explaining it to us after the fact, we closed ranks around her and against our father. He wasn't our father anymore after that. Moreover, in an awful realization, I understood that he had never been our father, not in the way fathers are supposed to be. He lived with us. He used us as his family, but he never did what fathers do for their families. I no longer hate him for that night. I, I no longer have the fear of him that I had for all those years growing up, although the gut reactions are still there. However, I still miss whatever it was I never got from him. We still saw my father in league games after he left, but he made believe he didn't see us or that we were invisible. Maybe that's where I first learned about becoming invisible. Anyway, if I could officially watch my father play baseball, I could still play baseball myself. I became fixated on the game with something I could do to kill the pain to release the energy that was building up in me. I was good at it. Boy, was I ever good at it. I'd been playing ball at the park even before my father left. I was a kid, 11 or 12, and like any kid, I played on pickup teams and finally in Little League. I remember one of my friends telling a Little League coach by the name of Willie West that I was a better player than some of the 15-year-olds that were on the team. Mr. West didn't believe him, but my friend kept after him, kept bugging him until uh, Mr. West agreed to take a look at me. He asked me to hit a few balls out, play the field a little bit, and toss a couple of pitches. Then he watched me in a game during which I hit about three or four balls to the next diamond. He came up to me after it and told me that he wanted me to show up for the Little League draft, but just to stand over on the side so people wouldn't notice me. My friend was laughing because he knew what Mr. West was up to. On the Saturday morning of the draft, I did just what he told me, standing over on the side as if I were completely invisible, which I was getting particularly good at doing, and waited for all the bigger guys to get picked. Then Mr. West picked me and the rest of the coaches fell on the grass laughing so hard I thought they would bring up their morning chitlins and grits. Him? One of them said, pointing at me and holding his guts as if they were going to explode all over the field, he's so skinny, he looks like a straw, and the rest is history. Well, actually, the other coaches did laugh quite a bit, but Mr. West managed to keep a straight expression on until we broke into our teams. Then he told me he would have a last laugh on them, and he was right. As the season went on, I began making a reputation for myself in the area, and the, the other kids wanted to meet, me to play for their teams, too. At that point, though, as much as I might have dreamed of being a big league ball player, those dreams were only the dreams that every kid dreams. I thought they were far, far away, but other people thought they were much closer than that. Baseball is a game of breaks like life. My, my first break came early, when I got to have Michael and Ronnie as my brothers. Michael and Ronnie were already working with a coach named John Mosley, who soon became one of the most important people in my life. Mr. Mosley was a neighbor of ours who had once played pro ball back in the old Negro Leagues and who was a truck driver by profession. He also was the assistant coach of the Compton College baseball team. He was really interested in my older brothers, both of whom he believed would have become major league players. And he was right. Michael, who was a cop in the Los Angeles Police Department, was and is a great athlete. He could play football and baseball and had all the basic physical strength you need to become a professional athlete. 
He was in Crenshaw High School already, however, and had his own life. He was socially very popular and a natural leader. My brother Ronnie was more familiar with my Little League games than Michael was at that point because Michael was becoming more interested in girls than he was in athletics. Ronnie had been talking to Mr. Mosley about me for months, even though while the coach kept telling him that the boy is too young, but Ronnie kept at it and finally said I was playing against high school teenagers who were twice my size and still dominating the game. That's what interested Mr. Mosley, Ronnie once told me. It was a chance for the coach to get his eye on a potential player as a young enough age where he could have some real effect. Just see him, Ronnie said. Just watch him play at the Diamond on Saturday and make your own decision. Okay, okay, Mr. Mosby finally said. Let's see what he does. Then the coach saw me hit on my first at bat and cluck like he was a mother hen. If I could fix his swing, he could be a long ball hitter, Ronnie told me the coach had said. And I know how the big leagues like long ball hitters. He told me you have to practice, you have to be dedicated, and you have to make yourself into a fanatic if you want to succeed. He said that he saw too many Little League ball players hit high school and start all the dating and partying you do at a neighborhood school like Crenshaw. A lot of good players lost sight of what they thought they wanted to when they were younger. Uh, don't be a fool, Mr. Mosley said. My, my people don't know what they're endowed with. When you got a talent that you can take you places, you got something precious. You've got to nurture it. You've you got to bring it along. You have to train it, hone it, aim it so it can take you as far as possible. You have to make yourself a promise to play fair with yourself and not piss away what you've been given. You know, when I was a 13-year-old, that sounded good to me. And let's face it, he was the first person who ever told me that I had a future in front of me. The night my father left, I was trapped in such a state of panic, I thought I didn't even deserve to have a future. Well, Mr. Mosley first opened the door a crack on what was to become an entire new world. He was one of the first male adults outside of my brothers who actually took an interest in what I could do and what I thought about. Mosley took uh, Michael, Ronnie, and me over to the Harvard Diamond, a park in the neighborhood, to practice baseball fundamentals on weekends and wherever we could get free in the afternoons after two jobs. He'd hit fly balls out to us all afternoon and sit us down and explain what he did right and what we did wrong. After we'd run ourselves around the outfield until we thought we couldn't breathe anymore, he'd take us out for some food. Well, in those dark days after our father left, Mr. Mosley was a lifesaver. He was more like a father than the father that had left us. It was as if Mr. Mosley had held a key that was able to unlock everything I had in my wishes and dreams. He gave us emotional and spiritual support. He would lecture us, and I mean lecture us, about staying in schools, applying ourselves to the books, and keeping away from the type of gang violence on the streets that we could see happening all around us and believing in our right to have a future. He used to talk me up all around the neighborhood. He believed, and now I can understand what he, why he thought that way, and that more people know about your skills, the more they will talk. The more people talk about the skills, the more they exaggerate the facts and begin making myth. Well, baseball scouts love myth because everybody believes in the natural, the shoeless kid whose raw skills turn around ball clubs. It happens. It's the American myth. My saying to everyone who would listen, I've got the best kid of all. He's going to be in the major leagues. He's going to dominate. Well, John Mosley helped create an aura of success that permeated everything I did while I was at Crenshaw. He, in his own way, is a genius. John gave me the tender loving care during the tough year or so after my father left. Then I went to Crenshaw High School where my brother Michael was a team center fielder. Well, by now, what I had done in Little League had gotten the attention of some of the newspapers and lots of coaches. Some of the papers began calling me the hottest major league prospect to come out of Los Angeles in, in years. Michael made sure I met the Crenshaw High School baseball coach, Brooks Hurst, who would become my next major influence and father figure. Mr. Hurst was a white man running a team of black high school ball players, and he was a real live version of the 70s television show White Shadow. Mr. Hurst had his hands full with me, and I can tell you that. I, I was a moody adolescent, nervous about being in high school, distrustful of older male authority figures in general, and out to cause trouble. Mr. Hurst was not someone to put up with a moody kid driven more by attitude than by desire. He told me right up front that he wasn't about to put me out in right field or replace the right field he already had. I wasn't a hot dog on his team, he told me, until I proved myself during the season. But I had my own ideas and wanted to play right field where I had played since Mr. Mosley had uh, taken over my training. We were only talking a, uh, a couple or three years here, but to a 15-year-old kid, two or so more years is a major chunk of his career. I played a lot of positions, sometimes in the outfield, sometimes at third, but I kept moping around despite Mr. Mr. Hurst's yelling at me to improve my butt around the field with more hustle. It got so that I became sick of the word hustle. One day, I simply ambled off the field at the end of the inning instead of running in. We lost that game that day, and Mr. Hurst bore down on the entire team. Then he turned on me because I was the most lackadaisical of all the players. You're just out of 10th grade, and you think you're a superstar already, he said. And he jabbed his finger right at the C on my chest of my uniform and bellowed, that C means hustle. When you wear it, you hustle. 
You know, I felt like a humiliated fool in front of the entire ball club. I took off my uniform right then and there and threw it on the ground. Man, I don't even want to play anymore, I said. I can play baseball all I want in the summer, I told myself. But, you know, I was lying. I went out for basketball and played under Joe Weekly, the Crenshaw coach. But to tell you the truth, basketball hurt my ankles. And as much as I liked the game, it was a real no-brainer. Not to insult anybody playing basketball, but I found it took more intelligence to figure out baseball situations than to toss a ball at a basket. You run a lot in basketball, it's true, and you have to know your position, of course. But let's face it, folks, it's you in the basket, right? I mean, the Lakers are a great team and all that, and they make the game look more like a ballet. But they say to this eight-foot Vlada Defot guy, hey, big dude, dunk this little ball in that hole. And he says, okay, Matakansky, jumps up and drops it down a hole like he's putting a dime in his pocket. Scotty, beam me up. Know what I mean? I spent the whole summer that year after my fight with Mr. Hurst even more moody and difficult. I, I, I finally swallowed my stupid pride and asked him if he could talk. We had a good talk and trying to explain my feelings and troubles to him. I realized how much I really loved baseball, how much it was really part of me and how I couldn't live without playing it. There was no way I could hide from that, I told him. I, I wanted to play. I wanted to be on the team. And I said, almost breaking into tears, I wanted to be on a great team because I needed to be on a great team. Mr. Hurst understood me. He explained that uh, he felt the same way about the game. I came back the following season, and we had a championship year. Our team was so strong that the Major League draft picked up three seniors from the Crenshaw Ball Club. Mr. Hurst just looked at me in a very knowing way when the news broke in the papers, and I realized just by the look in the man's eye that I would be next. That was the first time that I realized that I would have a real shot at breaking into the big leagues. I was thankful for Mr. Hurst's dedication to the school, to the team, and to the kids in our community. Then in my senior year, the attention of baseball scouts was turned on me. My senior year at Crenshaw was magic all the way to the championship game. We played a powerhouse school called Granada Hills in a city championship game at Dodger Stadium. Granada Hills was a strong club with a hot young pitcher who was also the school's quarterback. He should have stayed in football. A Mr. John Elway started at third base and then came to relieve. What an arm on that kid. I started in right field and then came on to relieve. The two of us dueled, but uh, Granada Hills came out on top in a heartbreaker of a contest. Life was changing for me. Uh, agents visited our kitchen, pushing cash into Ruby's hands and, and telling her they were giving me advance bonus to sign with them. They would negotiate the contract they were sure I would get when the draft was held. Ruby was at first flattered, but then offended. She saw that much of the attention was really pretty condescending. They wanted to tell him about the big money, she told a reporter for the New York Times in 1980. They feel that kids brought up in the ghetto, money excites them. It was more than money exciting me in 1980, Mama. It was the world. It was a big, beautiful, and wide open, and I believed I owned all of it. Well, the whole family came down in June 1980 when I graduated high school and entered the Major League Baseball draft. It was an exciting time, especially for an 18-year-old and a very hungry family. I had a backdoor plan just in case I wasn't picked in the Major League draft or if I couldn't come to terms with the team that had drafted me. Because I'd played varsity basketball at Crenshaw as well as baseball, I knew that I could have gotten a basketball scholarship to college and eventually play pro basketball. I could have played baseball in college, too. The decision would be which college to go to and which draft to think about after finishing college. But everything I could have hoped for in the draft happened. I was the number one pick in the entire country, and the Mets, the last place team in 1980, had that first pick. It was clear that I was going to New York to play ball if the Mets and I came to an agreement. I saw the Mets games on television, and I knew they played at Shea Stadium, but I didn't know how big New York was or how aggressive the New York sports writing community was. In fact, I didn't even know where New York was or anything else about it for that matter, but it didn't bother me at all. From the hordes of sports agent and law firm representatives that churned down Crenshaw Boulevard towards 7th Avenue, we narrowed the list down to a few likely prospects. I say we, but actually it was my mother with my father Henry putting in his two cents from time to time suddenly discovered he had a family. In reality, many reporters and scouts were talking to my father even before they were talking to my mother or me because he had spotted him at the games. It was a tricky situation for him as a person because he had to admit to himself that he'd walked away from his own family and now they weren't his family anymore. It must have been very painful for him. We've never seriously talked about it, although we've talked about other things. It'll be one of the great confrontations he and I will eventually have to have at some point step five. I suppose, during our respective recoveries. Neither of us is looking forward to it because it'll be a gut-wrenching experience, but it has to be. Well, after many interviews, we decided we liked what Richmond Bry had to say the most and hired him. A few days later, he negotiated my first major league contract with the Mets. In June 1980, I was staring at a $200,000 bonus, taking the Mets' guarantee that I would make it up to the majors in three years and planning what I would do with the money. Actually, I bought myself a Buick Riviera, the 
car I'd always wanted and brought my mother a Datsun Z. Then I put the rest of the money in her hand and planned to take off. I reported to work as a player at the New York Mets Rookie League farm team in Kingsport, Tennessee. It was like going to another planet at the very end of the universe. Kingsport was so small that if I had a traffic light, people would have stood out in the street to watch it change. But the Kingsporters loved their local baseball team and followed with their loyalty and enthusiasm you, you can see only in the minor leagues. My arrival in Kingsport was the subject of a national press conference that put the entire team on display. I was the center of the conference, not because of anything basic to myself, but because of the New York press frenzy surrounding my selection in the draft. I was put on notice that the New York sports writers would be following my every move in the minors because they were tracking my development as a ball player. The more the Mets floundered, the more the press wanted to focus on me as a future of the team. I was very fortunate to have a manager like Chuck Hiller, who played Major League Ball with the San Francisco Giants, the New York Mets, the Philadelphia Phillies, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was amused by the activities surrounding my arrival, but he wasn't in awe of it. He told me that he had seen plenty of talented kids with lots of promise come through the system, only to listen to their own press and never live up to their potential. He told me something valuable. Don't worry about your potential. That's what someone else puts on you. Worry about what you do in the field every day, and the potential will take care of itself. I understood what he meant, but really didn't know how to do what he said to do. Just be your own person, Chuck kept on telling me. That forces people to take you on your terms instead of you having to take them on their terms. Chuck was one of the rare baseball managers who didn't let reputation get in the way. I was an 18-year-old kid away from my family for the first time in my life when I entered his turf, and he treated me like the lonely, tentative kid I really was. He kept the press from making my life miserable and provided me with the closest thing I had to a family structure that entire year. I was pleased with my first season. In 44 games, I'd batted 268, hit five home runs, and batted in 20 runs. The following year, I was assigned to the Mets A-Ball Club in Lynchburg, Virginia. Again, I was lucky to find a manager who befriended me in ways uh, far beyond what would normally be required. His name was Gene Dussan, and he saw almost immediately that I was playing far below my professional abilities. The press had already descended on Virginia for their strawberry feast because the Mets had begun another disastrous season. Gene kept on pushing me, and I kept on pushing forward and gradually broke through the second third of the season. Gene taught me how to listen as well as how to improve my playing skills. He convinced me to take what he was saying seriously, and in so doing, I learned that listening was also a very important skill. I ended up hitting a respectable 255 with 13 home runs in Lynchburg in 1981. It wasn't great, but I contributed to the team and showed the Mets that I was gradually coming along. At Lynchburg, I experienced more pressure than I had seen at the Kingsport team in the Rookie League that year before. I also experienced first-hand racism from the fans. I perceived in no uncertain terms in the attitudes of the people around me, the locals, the fans, other black players, that I was in the South now and that I had to be extra careful. You could hear some of the racist comments from the fans when you're on the field, and my skin would crawl whenever we'd get off the team bus in some town that looked as though the year was still 1950. I understood, actually, it was more of a sensation than anything else, what racism can do to you. The racism that I sensed in Virginia was just like a force field of hate. You know it's there. You can see how it changes the light coming through it. You can even feel it uh, like a heaviness all around you, but you can't point to one specific thing and say, see that? Now do something about it. It's as if there was someone with a smirking grin behind you all the time, but every time you turn around, he's suddenly gone. The racism that I perceived certainly affected me by putting negative thoughts right into my brain. I was already feeling down because I was away from my family, and the comments I was hearing just off to the side or barely with an earshot made me feel uh, especially angry and sad at the same time. That's why I was so lucky to have found uh, Gene Dussan. Gene explained that I would be hearing a lot of personal and ugly comments from the fans over the years and that uh, many of them would in fact be racist. You can't let them get to you, he said, or you can understand them for what they're they are and defeat them by being all the better for it. He told me, keep yourself focused on the future. It's not just athletic skills you develop in the minors, it's mental skills and character. The more a coach or a manager can instill confidence in an athlete's character, the more that person will be able to accomplish and the sooner he'll be able to do it. Gene Dusan did this for me and the Mets recognized his ability by promoting him along with me to their double-A ball club in Jackson, Mississippi the following year of 1982. At first, I was more than a little nervous going into the heart of the Deep South, where so many bloody civil rights battles have been fought. But I was in for a very happy surprise. Jackson is a college town in some ways like L.A.'s Westwood, and I had a friend at Jackson State. The town seemed uh, home already, and he showed me places to go, things to do, and food to eat, and people to see. I felt better at Jackson than I'd felt at either Kingsport or Lynchburg. I had a monster of a season at Jackson. I hit more home runs than I'd hit in two previous years combined, and a whopping 97 RBIs. 
I felt in complete control of my game, of my swing, of, and what was going on in the field. Maybe the newness of being a Met had worn off, and maybe, I think this is more likely, I was getting used to the minor league pitches and probably had acclimated myself to playing under the pressure to produce in the minors. Whatever it was, I was never more sure of what I could do than I was in the 1982 season down at Jackson. Then right before I was moved up, I was voted the most valuable player in the whole Texas League. I was feeling good. I was feeling strong. I was feeling ready. The Mets thought I was ready, too, because at the end of that season on schedule, I went up to the International League to play triple-A ball at Tidewater. I helped the Tides win the playoffs that year, and by the end of the season, I was feeling very good about being a member of the Mets. I had a sense that I was in a family in which I was playing an important role. Rather than taking off in the winter of 1982, I decided to push the year by playing winter ball in South America for a team in Caracas, Venezuela. Now, that was a unique experience because it sped up my development, to be sure, and it also let me see what the world was like outside of the United States for the first time in my life. I didn't speak Spanish, but I wanted the opportunity to play against aggressive professional athletes who were far more experienced than I was. I began the 1983 season in the Tidewater as a AAA ball player on the way to the majors. I felt confident after my season in South America because I'd been able to hit some of their best pitches. These were guys who might someday be in the major leagues themselves. Davey Johnson was managing down in Tidewater in 1983, and we began our six-year association. I had a great spring at St. Petersburg, Florida for the Mets, and I know they were considering bringing me right up, but they decided to let me start the season off in Tidewater just to make sure that my performance the year before hadn't been a freak and that I was off and running before they made room for me on the roster. Well, everybody knew and I knew that I'd be going up that year. My first 10 or so games at Tidewater were spectacular. Whether I had improved to the point where I could hit anything any AAA pitcher could throw or whether the AAA pitching wasn't as good as it was supposed to be, I don't know. I only know that the fastballs I was seeing weren't nearly as fast as they'd been in the Winter League and the curveballs took too much time to move. Maybe that made me too confident, but I was hitting the ball very well and was very happy about it. At the same time, the Mets got off to a dreadful start. They were getting bombed right off the field like they were mismatched against every team they played. Their pitching staff was struggling because the offense couldn't produce any runs. Whoever managed to get on base by action or by free kid or probably by walk simply gave grew a beard and died there at the end of the inning. I got my call to the majors and made my debut against Mario Soto and the Cincinnati Reds. I struck out three times that night and then popped up. At least I had something so I could remember what it felt like to make contact with a baseball. But what did he have on that ball? I kept asking myself. This guy threw me stuff I'd never seen before in my life. He wasn't faster than pitches I'd faced in the minors, but he had a million times more control than you'd expect. He knew right where he wanted the ball to cross the strike zone or catch a corner of the plate. He never got behind me, never made any mistakes, never, never let me figure out where his next pitch would be. By the time I brought my bat around, the ball was long gone since. I looked like a born whiffer. The Mets were managed in 1983 by George Bamberger when I first came up. George didn't have much to say to me. In fact, he didn't have much to say to anybody other than just go out there and have fun. Well, that was advice I could relate to because I had just achieved my lifelong dream of reaching the major leagues. Other people in the Mets, such as Dave King and Tom Seaver and George Forster, weren't really having too much fun being humiliated on the field. I, too, was quickly caught up in the whirlwind of it all as, as the Mets' season spun into disaster for the fourth year in a row. The newspapers, always ready to lend a helping news, were already howling. They said, and who was I to argue, that I was the first black potential baseball star to start a career in New York. I know, I know, Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays and Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, Monty Irvin and Reggie Jackson, on and on. But these are their words, not mine. Robinson, Mays, Campy, Nuke, and Irvin all began their careers in the old Negro Leagues. Reggie, of course, had been in Oakland before George Steinbrenner brought him to the Yankees. I was absolutely paralyzed with fear. No matter what we send up to the plate, the newly acquired Keith Hernandez, pinch hitter Rusty Staub, or myself, there simply was no magic at all. We just couldn't hit the ball consistently enough to score any runs. We were pathetic. Well, George finally turned in his clipboard and resigned as a manager. Frank Howard, who'd been one of the more vocal coaches, took over. The magnitude of what professional baseball was began to get to me. The hype of major leagues, the uh, thousands of fans in the stadiums, all of them cheering or booing or whatever. A sense of being surrounded by a huge physical structure whenever you stepped up to the plate and your name blaring over the loudspeakers. It was more, much more than I had dreamed of when I allowed myself to dream of being a big league ball player. It was no fantasy. It was a real thing. I was struggling, confused, and looking at too many things at the same time. I was worried about being away from home, missing my current girlfriend, seeing new cities for the first time in my life, 
and facing new pitches and different types of pitches. It was all overwhelming. Being in the majors, realizing my dream of a lifetime, actually achieving a serious goal by the time I was only 21, just hit me all at the same time in June of 1983. Jim Fry played the role of my life during that period that Jane Dusan had played the year before, and the year before that at Mr. Mosley even earlier. It's a role that I seem to need to have played out for me. Dr. Alan Lance told me years later because it fills a gap that my father should have filled. However, in 1983, I didn't know any of that. I only knew that I felt myself falling into uncomfortably familiar pattern and having to rely on the ex expertise of Jim Fry to get it out of me. You've got to be the one to help yourself, Coach Fry told me. Sure, I can help you, but only with the mechanics of hitting. The confidence, the belief, and the ability to hit the ball has to come entirely from you. Well, Jim opened up a whole new world of dealing with Major League Pitching. He pointed out that I was my own worst enemy at the plate by wanting to hit home runs so badly that I didn't look at what the pitcher was doing. They're not going to give you any home run balls, he would say. You have to make them give you your pitch by showing them you can hit their pitches. It's all mental, he would say. Each of you has to find out what the other guy can't give up, then chip away at him to get him to give it up. Then you can swing at stuff they wouldn't normally throw you because they're afraid to walk you to a base when there's a chance you'll ground out. So they pitch, and that's when your percentage comes up. I got selective. I became aware of what I could and couldn't hit. Then I added to that list what I should and should not swing at. Soon I found myself connecting with the ball more than I was not connecting with the ball. At the end of the season, I was at 257, which wasn't bad at all for a rookie. I also had 26 home runs and had 74 RBIs. Finally, this came as a surprise. I was named the Rookie of the Year at the end of the season. 1983 was also the year in which I met my wife to be least in a Lakers game at the Forum. I saw her standing in the crowd, and I said to my friends, Wow, who is she? She kills me. She is gorgeous. I was a rookie of the year in New York Met, and I was pretty impressed with myself when my friends introduced us. I visited her a couple of times like a real gentleman and, and sent her flowers. Then we began dating. What impressed me most about Lisa was her ability to be happy. She wasn't like me. She didn't have the anger inside of her that she had, had to work out. She seemed always happy, always smiling. I had been more sensitive to what was going on around me. I had, might have been seeing the seeds of trouble that were just beginning to germinate while we were dating during 1984. I already became a local here in Los Angeles and liked to flirt with women. Women would come up to us when we were eating out together and begin to flirt with me in front of her. Maybe I should have shut it down right away, but I didn't, and it made her mad. I should have seen the writing on the wall, but I, too, was busy being a Met and a baseball hero. I wanted marriage, too, and I overlooked the obvious danger signs of jealousy and fighting as we drifted into an engagement in 1984. I had a warm glow inside me as 1983 came to a close. As I prepared for the 1984 season, I was already excited. Of course, I couldn't realize at the time, but in 1984, I'd meet the best friend I'd ever make in my entire life. He was two years younger than I, but headed in my direction. In 1984, the doctor would be in. 1984 was a year the magic slowly began to happen both for the Mets and for me personally. I became engaged to Lisa, and we decided to get married the following year. It was also the year the ingredients would come together for the ball club. Frank Cashin's trades and the team's draft choices finally crossed paths in 1984, and the team on paper looked as if it had a chance to crawl out of the cellar. Our pitching staff would gel, our heading would become consistent, and our defense would begin to play as a team instead of like a bunch of guys playing pickup schoolyard stickball. But I could never have predicted the successes that were awaiting us in 1984 when I packed my bags at the close of the 83 season and left New York for California. The Mets wound up winning only 68 games and losing 94 in 1983. Big Frank Howard bit the dust at the end of the 83 season as well, and Coach Jim Fry, for his part, went over to the Cubs and won the division in 1984. I was glad that Jimmy Fry got himself his own team to manage. I knew from how he helped me that he'd be an asset to any team he worked for. Fry was a player's coach and a player's manager. No matter how difficult a player's situation, he was always able to see it from both the player's point of view and the team's. Then he'd somehow put the two points of view together so that they made sense. When I saw the Cubs play in 1984, I realized that Jim Fry's presence on the team was making things happen. He was motivating players, and I wish he'd stayed on the Mets. In October 1983, the Mets named my old manager from Tidewater, Davey Johnson, as the team's manager. Davey was in a unique position to put together the new Mets from their farm teams. Because Davey had been involved with the farm system at all levels and had managed at Tidewater through 1983, he was one of the few people in the whole organization who was in touch with all of the Mets' brightest prospects. Frank Cashin was working out savvy trades to acquire veteran players. Between Davey and Frank, an entirely new ball club was emerging, for it was an exciting time to be a Met because I was at the center of a new ball club that was taking shape right before our eyes. While I played in the minors and the Mets crawl around at the bottom of the division, Cashin was patient about bringing up his new prospects. 
Now, in 1984, I could see that the years of patience were about to pay off. The chemistry seemed to be right, and I believed that we would begin to make our move in the division. The key to our drive would be the pitching of Dwight Gooden. Like me, Dwight had been drafted right out of school, where he had earned a reputation as one of the best high school pitchers in the country. Sports writers were making pilgrimages to Florida just to see the good and fastball that seemed to go on afterburners as it got to the plate. Dwight not only was consistent in his control, he, was, he knew how to set you up with his curve before blowing the heat right by you at the exact moment when he knew you were forced to swing. With only a three or four pitch repertoire, he could strike out over half the batters he faced each inning and get himself out of trouble on a few occasions when they were runners on base. The result was Dr. K. Doc also thinks when he pitches, unlike many major league hurlers. That puts him in the same category with Nolan Ryan and Earl Hershiser, two of the most mental pitchers I know. All of these guys think way ahead of the batter. They understand that they have the edge over the batter in one regard. They know where the ball is supposed to go. In 1983, after Davey had jumped up to Tidewater, where he helped the Tides in two International League playoff games, Davey knew that Doc was ready. He began working on Cashin as early as that winter. He pushed and he pushed. The kid's ready, he would tell Cashin. Not another Tim Larry, Cashin reportedly told him, remembering what happened to the pitcher he brought up too early in 1981. I'm not going through that again for anybody. Gooden never pitched double A. He needs at least a full year on the tides. They compromised even though Davey wanted Doc brought up right away. Dwight pitched his first few games down in triple A, but Cashin agreed to keep his eye on him too. Gooden's stats weren't mind-boggling. He only struck out nine batters over 18 innings in five games, but his poise simply blew people away. Before the 1984 season started to build up steam, Davey was able to press home his point with Cashin, and Doc was moved up to the major leagues. Once on the Mets, Davey treated him with kid gloves. He had this guy on a clock, work so many innings, rest so many innings, throw so many pitches, lay off for so many starts. It was like Davey wanted to compress a year in Jackson and a year in Tidewater into the space of a few months. He didn't force a push, Doc, but used the right mix at work, exposure and instruction to bring him along at the speed of light. Whatever I might say about Davey's treatment of me and the dumb mistakes he made after 1986, and I have to say a lot, I can only praise him for his management of Dwight Gooden. From the moment Doc arrived in the Mets clubhouse, we became friends. Like me, Doc carried the weight of potential, and that helped create our friendship. In 1984, all was hope, all was promise, everything was focused on our glorious future. Who would have thought that just a year after being in last place, we would inch our way in the first place in the East on July 31, 1984? It was a complete turnabout. The sense of team spirit that grew in 1984 captured all of us. It was here that a lot of the seeds of our magnificent 1986 team and our almost magnificent 1988 team were planted. When Davies stuck Ron Dowling into the starting pitching rotation alongside Doc, he got himself another focused pitcher to go with Doc. Now, both of these guys were supported in relief by Jesse Orozco, who by 1984 had developed the reputation of being able to pitch the Mets out of any dogfight, no matter how ugly it got. Keith Hernandez was exactly the kind of stability the team needed at first. He and I battled in the press for the entire season, but his being at first base and my backing him up in right gave me a feeling of tremendous security, not to mention his consistent 300-plus batting average. Mookie Wilson was known as a spoiler who could cause trouble for opposing teams in any situation. Mookie was a guy who was hit and walk would start rallies. He was trouble once he was on base. Something about him made opposing teams nervous and got them to make errors. Then there was Rusty Staub and Ray Knight, two of the most consistent threats in the Mets' dugout. Rusty was never rusty. I would watch this guy walk into a game after not having played for over a week and take a couple of warm-up swipes and unload a base hit to start a late-inning rally. Then I'd see Ray Knight coming right out of the cold, challenge some of the toughest relief truckers in the league, and punch out a killer double right into the gap. When the starters were following, guys like Staub and Knight would make things happen. That's how I knew we were a team touched by destiny. I was thrilled to be a Met in 1984, even though I was already in trouble with the press because I was yapping too much about needing to be on a winning team when we're duking it out with the Cubs in first place around the middle of the summer. I was totally happy. Each day you'd want to get to the park as soon as you could because playing baseball was so much fun. The team made it into first and I was a contender for the championship of the National League East until September. Then Keith Hernandez and some of the other players took shots back at me for mouthing off to the press at the start of spring training over how there seemed to be so many players on the team the year before that just didn't care about winning and how I wanted to lead the team to victory. Keith, in an interview, said that I gave up too easily in tough situations. 
While it was certainly gracious of Keith to forgive what he saw as my indifference and the wasting of my natural talent by writing it off to the problems that players have in their second year, and while it was understanding and compassionate of him to sympathize with my second year blues because even he, the great Hernandez, experienced them himself when he was only a second year player, I didn't appreciate what he said one bit. After his interview was printed, Keith came scrapping across the clubhouse to me to express the hope that I didn't misconstrue his comments, which were only aimed at making me a better player. He hoped I understood and that I wouldn't take offense. I told him that I was good and pissed. Whenever Hernandez was frustrated about his own issues, he would mouth off to the press about players he felt should take up the slack and place them on notice that he was displeased. Maybe he worried about his own bat instead of other players' performances. He wouldn't create such hard feelings. Besides, for all his chronic complaining, I still got more RBIs than Hernandez in 1984, 97 to 94, and led the team in home runs. I came around after the Keith Hernandez interview. That's partly what makes me so mad. I'd invested so much in what Keith had to say that even though it was insulting, I still responded. It gives me a cold chill not only to realize that, but to realize what the paper said after I pulled out of my slump. The newspaper report said that I woke up, came around, and started working again. You know, it burned me that they thought that something Hernandez said had that much effect as if, oh, excuse me, Mr. Mex, was I napping on my broom? I mean, bat? What do you mean, wake up? What an insulting thing to read about yourself. If you're black when you're in a hitting slump, you're just plain lazy. Black players can't have slumps just like they can't have injuries. When you finally pull out of a slump, it's because someone usually, uh, someone in a whiter shade of pink or acceptable variation thereof has booted you the hell out of the slump, kicked you out of your back porch, so to speak. But despite the problems that Keith and I had in 1984, I would continue to have right through 1989, I still respected him as a baseball player who could consistently hit a solid 300 year after year, play an outstanding first base, and keep a young pitcher from falling apart on the mound despite a crisis situation in the game. Keith solidified the infield for the Mets and helped stabilize our team defensively. The 1984 season was a heady one for me personally, if not for the rest of the team. I never played in a major league first place team before, and just being on the Mets for those few days when we were in first of a game or so ahead of the Cubs was one of the sweetest, most exhilarating feelings I ever had. I know there were guys who had been around the league longer than I who got depressed after we slipped back in a second, but I didn't. I saw a whole future ahead of me and also for Doc. I could hardly wait for 1985. I was primed as I read the sports pages over the winter. Frank Cashin was making the moves that would help us go all the way. You could see how he was thinking when he brought three veterans, third baseman Howard Johnson and Ray Knight and catcher Gary Carter to the Mets. We got Carter from Montreal in exchange for Yubi Brooks. Now we had a lineup that would include Keith Hernandez, Mookie Wilson, Howard Johnson, Gary Carter, and myself. The New York papers were saying that the Mets were going to be a team to beat in the East in 1985. There was so much new hitting power in the 1985 Mets that when the season started, the hitters had a kind of a camaraderie that hadn't existed the previous year. We each seemed to be able to pick up the slack from the other person. We let off our first two games with artillery blasts of hitting power. Gary Carter was our first hero, getting late hitting and tie-breaking hits that turned around the first five or six games. His enthusiasm and raw energy seemed to make things happen from right out of nowhere and infected the entire team with a spirit. It was fun to be in the Mets now. Dwight Gooden got off to a strong start, too. We were all pulling together just like a family because it seemed like no single player was being held responsible for the Mets' success. As a team, our batting average early on was actually pretty low, but whenever someone went cold, someone else got hot and the team rambled on like a car held together by bailing wire. It was a fun time because you never knew what was going to happen the next day. Then in the game against the Phillies on May 11th, in which Sid Fernandez was pitching a shutout, I'll never forget that play. Juan Samuel, now my teammate, hit a bloop at a very shallow right. I saw the angle on it, I timed how it was dropping, and I really thought I had a play on it. But the harder I dug to get it, the more it seemed to drop as if to win, but there was no win at taking it and plunging it right down. But I was whipped up by the gussy spirit of the Mets, and I thought I had, as I stretched, I can get this. It's not out of reach. But as I dove for it, I jammed my right thumb back into my hand and felt the pain shoot through my whole arm like an electric shock. I rolled over on the ground, grabbed my thumb, and held on to it as someone was going to take it away. I couldn't believe the pain. It was throbbing, and I pumping up and down my arm. I couldn't stop. I kept cursing. No, no, it can't end here. I thought my world had come to an end, and I finally stopped rolling and, and tried to get to my feet. The next thing I realized, the trainers were lifting me up. They hauled me out of the game before I even remembered my own name. The, they x-rayed the hell out of my hand, my arm, my brain, everything they could x-ray, and found out that I had torn ligaments of my thumb. And oh man, did it hurt. 
It hurt my heart, too, because I knew just from the way the base of my thumb felt it was going to take a long, long time to get back to normal. Davy Johnson told the press the next day that it was his darkest hour. I can still feel the pain to this very day. Well, fortunately for us, the Chicago Cubs began to stagger at the same time, mainly due to injuries, and we stayed neck and neck with them through the spring and into the summer. By then, however, St. Louis, as well as Montreal, had begun to make their move, and we looked around to find out that our hand-to-hand combat with the Cubs had turned into a 14 free-for-all. Good. I was back in the lineup even though my thumb was killing me. I still couldn't get the grip on the bat that I needed and therefore couldn't get any power into my swing. In fact, though I returned to the lineup on June 28th, I didn't really come back until somewhere in early July. Things had gotten really tense in the National League East because we had refused to fade away or disappear. St. Louis had actually knocked Chicago all the way down to fourth in a crucial series, and that left us sitting in third about three games out. Now, edging into September, the Cardinals had express train right through the National League East and were ahead of us in the standings. By October 1, there were only two baseball teams in the entire world, the Mets and the Cardinals. And it was the Mets just three games out of first who pulled into St. Louis for a National League East series that would draw more interest than the World Series itself. Oh my, how Ron Dowling pitched that first night. He and John Tudor to battle for nine nerve-wracking innings of absolute scoreless baseball. Then Dowling was replaced by Jesse DeFime and Orozco in the 10th, who continued to pitch scoreless ball. To open the 11th, the Cards replaced Tudor with Ken Daly, who struck Keith out first and then set Ken Carter whiffing back to the dugout. I stepped into the batter's box next. I was swollen with power and fury, ready for baseball. Daly, you're meat, I screamed to myself. Then the jerk tried to smoke me. I mean, smoke me. Kaboom! The ball wouldn't stop flying. On and out it went, deep into the right center field bleachers. Up and up, soared high over the bleachers. The entire stadium went into its feet as the ball bounced high on the scoreboard and disappeared somewhere in the superstructure of the stadium. Yes, yes, fireworks, cheers, victory. The whole world comes alive with a round trip, a home run. I love hitting home runs. We were just two games out of first. On the very next night, Doc Gooden took the mound for the Mets. He had an off night, only struck out 10 batters, but our offense struck early and hard and left the cards gasping for breath 5-2. to two. We were one game out of first. The next night, we almost did it. Almost, almost. By the seventh, the game had settled into a manager's duel of relief pitches while the cards settled into a 4-2 to two lead. We clawed another run out of the cards in the eighth. Then in the ninth, Keith got the first base on a neat two-out single over shortstop, and we had a chance to tie the game when Gary Carter came to the plate. Our hearts started pounding again. Just get a hit, Gary, any, any hit. Get on base, Gary, and I'll get you home. Whitey Herzog brought Jeff Lottie to pitch to uh, Carter. Gary tried as hard as he could, but Lottie got him to hit a fly ball to right that with two outs ended the game for us right then and there. We were sorrowful as we returned to New York, weepy as we knocked off Montreal while the Cards beat the Cubs. Then the next day, the Cards beat the Cubs again while we were losing to the Expos. Our season was over. Next year, New York, next year. We had a sense of destiny in 1986, a belief that uh, it would all come together for us in a great historic display of baseball power. Davies said it was in the numbers. We felt it was in our hearts. We had been separate players in 1984. We had come together as a team in 1985, and the fans had showed us they cared about what we almost accomplished. Now we had matured in 1986, and we were going to bring it home for all New York to see. I gave my personal demons a feast in that summer of 1986. I became estranged from my wife, estranged from my friends, and so totally fixated on the game, the, the game, the game, that the rest of the world faded away. When that happens to you, as it has to, you're going to take it all the way. You're supposed to understand that you'll repair the damage at the end of the season. But I didn't understand that. I'd found a championship season type of life that I could relate to, a kind of lifestyle that made myth into reality and made superhuman feats into daily accomplishments. When you're on that kind of high without the weight of real life to bring you down, you tend to fall down. I mean hard, but I didn't know I was already falling until after the World Series. But on the field, I was a Met, one of the killers of the National League. No matter what they did to us, we were never out of first place for the rest of the year, and we marched into the National League Championship Series against the Houston Astros with more than a 20-game lead. Houston pitcher Mike Scott, whom Cashin had traded away years earlier, who had it in for us because of what he thought he got a raw deal in New York, had mastered the art of throwing what was generally agreed to be the most unhittable pitch in baseball, the split-fingered fastball. Mike Scott had led us around like dogs to a hoop during the regular season. We were afraid of him. In fact, given our whole ballsy season, Mike Scott remained the one soft spot in our platinum-coated attitude. The National League Championship Series was a highly charged physically, very emotional and pumped up with all sorts of bravado and craziness. But the games themselves were incredible athletic contests. 
I had never been in a tougher series of games. Our strategy was as simple as any strategy can be. The nights when Scott wasn't pitching were must-wins. One loss to any pitcher besides Scott meant that we'd probably face him in Game 7 and lose the championship. Game 1 in Houston was almost too predictable. Split finger Mike kept us looking, fanning, and dribbling little grounders along the third base line. We could barely get a man on base, and when we did, we died there from, from boredom. But we ran back against Houston the next night and two nights later in the Game 3 in New York. Then we faced Mike Scott again in Game 4 and folded up like a tent. But our strategy had worked so far in it with Scott 2 and the Mets 2 going into Game 5 against the other Houston ace, Nolan Ryan. We, of course, had to dock the Doc Gooden, who had been so effective for all of us all season long. In the early innings of the Game 5, Nolan kept striking us out and Doc pitched himself out of some tight spots. In the fifth cano, I made my contribution by nailing Ryan for a blast that tied the game at one apiece. The game stayed tied and went into extra innings. Ryan was pulled for a pinch swinger in the top of the tent and was replaced in the mound by Charlie Kerfield in the bottom of the inning. Jesse Orozco came for Gooden in the 11th. In the 12th inning, Dykstra let off by grounding out. Backman then walked and advanced a second on a wild pitch to the next batter, Keith Hernandez. So Kerfield uh, intentionally walked Hernandez to get to Gary Carter, who had been slumming badly throughout the playoffs. Was that an insult to the kid? You better believe it. Gary brought his bat around like a sledgehammer and smashed the ball right over Charlie's head and up the middle for a base hit that sends Wally Bachman sliding into home and winning game five for the Mets. I was so pumped that I could kill on the battlefield, but this abundance of emotion was making me kill what was left of my marriage. Lisa wouldn't let up at all, and every night we were having violent arguments. My adrenaline was flowing. I was putting my fists through walls. I was so crazy with passion and trying to maintain my edge that I, I wasn't thinking clearly about anything, least of all domestic issues. I was in some of the toughest, most intense kicking-ass baseball I ever played in my whole life, and I was fighting with my wife over who the hell knows what. Hey, girl, put it on hold, I'd scream to her. My head's in another place. But the fighting continued. Try to put yourself in this situation. You've got to go out there and perform in a hyper-pressure, aggressive, macho, physical, shoot-first-and-ask-questions-later kind of situation. You have no time to think about anything else but beating up the other guy, or hell, he'll beat you up. We're facing Mike Scott and Nolan Ryan, who take no prisoners. If I zone out for even a second to think about the issues Lisa's raising or worry about whether I have a marriage or not, I'm letting myself down and all the guys who rely on me, not to mention the zillions of New York fans watching the game. There was no backing off and backing down as Lisa and I kept fighting. I could feel the violence rising inside of me and the howling of so many demons. I was out of control. I was being paid to be out of control and physical. I'm sorry for what I did, but I did it at the time when everybody around me had wanted violence and a display of raw power. I tried to tell her to stop. I almost begged her just to wait for another week or so. Go back to California. Go to New York. Go stay with your mother. For heaven's sake, just don't mess me up while I'm trying to play this game. But she wouldn't stop. I know there's no excuse for hitting your wife, just like there's no excuse for being an alcoholic. But the truth is that I'm an alcoholic, and I also hit Lisa so hard I sent her flying back when it broke her nose. I'm sick to my stomach over what I did and how I hurt her, and I blame myself. Still, I tried to put it all behind me. Then I went to the Astrodome for Game 6 and all the marbles. The Mets had gotten a well-deserved reputation for not folding up when games entered the twilight zone of 13, 14, and 15 innings. But never did I believe I had a playoff game going to 16 innings with the managers of both teams throwing everybody they could into the battle. This sixth game of the 1986 National League playoffs would be fought in the long, long shadow of Mike Scott, who had shut us down in Games 1 and 4, and who we feared had what it took to shut us down in Game 7. Therefore, whatever we did, we had to avoid Game 7 and Mike Scott at all costs. Bob Nepper was the third big gun on the Houston Astros pitching staff. The left-hander was known for his off-speed, deceptive breaking balls that got batters to swing at nothing. Power hitters found themselves hitting pop flies to shallow center, or easy ground was a short and second. I had blasted him early in the series, but it was still frustrating to try to swing hard on the guy. In the top of the first, Nepper retired three matches in a row, but Bobby Ojeda allowed three runs to cross the plate in the bottom of the inning. The score remained the same for the next five innings. Davey pulled Bobby over for Prince Swing and Lee Mazzilli in our sixth, but Lee didn't make anything happen, and we, were, we went down one, two, three. Rick Aguilera replaced Ojeda in the mound and had to pitch himself out of a jam in the Astros' sixth, and we were still trailing three to nothing in the top of the seventh. Still facing Nepper, who kept dinking us into uh, Palookaville, again sending us down one, two, three. In our eighth, he forced Rafael Santana to hit into a double play to end what might have been a run-scoring inning. Fortunately, Aguilera held off the Astros through the eighth also. 
Davey opened up our ninth by sending Lenny Dykstra to pinch hit, and he powered a base hit into center field that uh, Billy Hatcher overplayed and allowed to get by him for a triple. You could feel the team come alive. Next up was Mookie, who went with Nepper's third pitch, an 0-2 count, and rifled it into right field for a base hit that scored the speedy Dykstra. There were still no outs, and we were down by only two runs with Wilson on first. Nepper was thinking double play, and I got Kevin Mitchell hit a ground ball to third. But the ball was hit so slowly that they had no play on Mookie at second and to set up for throwing Kevin out at first. Now we had another run in scoring position, only one out, and Mex Hernandez stepping into the batter's box. Keith was as cool as any batter I'd ever seen under such circumstances. He didn't go after the garbage that Nepper had been feeding us for eight innings. He forced Nepper in a war of nerves to pitch right to him and belted a double to right center that brought Mookie home and made the score three to two and put the tying run in scoring position. Now it was up to Gary and me, and we knew it. Gary had been the hero the day before and still had what it took. Astros manager Hal Linnea pulled Nepper for Dave Smith to pitch to Gary and me. Dave Smith had been sitting in the bullpen until just this inning, and he was still not fully warmed up. Gary knew this and played a war of nerves with the pitcher until he got ball four and trotted off to first. Like Gary, I held my bat to back while Smith pitched me four balls to load the bases with only one out. Ray Knight was up next, and he golfed a long, high-sacrifice fly, bringing in Keith from third with a tying run. That was it for us in the ninth. We played scoreless ball for the next four innings. In the 14th, the Astros sent in Aurelio Lopez to face Gary Carter, me and Ray Knight, and Wally Bachman. Gary pounded a sharp single into right. I walked because Lopez was afraid to pitch to me. Ray Knight tried a sacrifice bunt that resulted in Carter's being thrown out at third while I advanced to second and Knight got to first. Then Wally Bachman stepped up to the plate. When Wally singled in the right field, I saw my chance to score the go-ahead run. Kevin Bass tried to get me at home, but his throw was late and too high as Bachman advanced to second and Knight to third on the play. Now the score was 4-3. to three. Howard Johnson then popped out to the catcher. Dykstra was intentionally walked, and Mookie struck out. So the inning was over, and the Astros had one run down. Jesse Orozco came in to pitch the bottom of the 14th. With one out, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Billy Hatcher, but with the full count, he couldn't get the fastball by him, and the center fielder slammed a home run off the left field foul pole. Well, very few pitchers in the baseball would have hung in there after a shot like that, but Jesse was one of those pitchers. He stayed jaw to jaw with the power of the Astros' order and got Denny Walling in the ground of the first and Glenn Davis an infield fly to Wally Bachman. The game went on into the 15th inning. I let off the top of the 16th. Aurelio threw me a pitch that I expected would be a fastball. What else can you get from Senior Smoke? But the son of a gun tricked me. As I swung like a monster for the right field stands, the ball came in like a corkscrew and only caught it with the top of my bat and squibbed it high into the air. As it drifted in the very shallow center, I realized that Hatcher wouldn't be able to make the play no matter how hard he dug. As I rounded first, I saw that the stupid ball had taken an extra high bounce off the artificial turf and it popped up between Hatcher and shallow center and Duran, who had drifted back from second. I turned on the speed, dug for second, and reached the bag standing up. Ray Knight was stepping out of the on-deck circle. He was also due. Ray saw how tired Aurelio was, and when Lopez just laid the ball across the plate, Ray pounded a base hit the deep right, and I came home easily, breaking the tie, while Ray rumbled over to second on the throw. The score was 5-4, to four, with a runner on scoring position and no outs in the top of the 16th, and Linnea pulls Lopez out for Jeff Calhoun. This guy hasn't pitched in the dog's age. My, oh, my, I said to myself in the dugout. There's panic among the Texans in Houston. Well, Calhoun tried to pitch to Wally Bachman, but walked him in the process of throwing a wild pitch that moved Knight to third. Then facing Jesse Orozco, Calhoun threw an amazingly wild pitch that allowed Ray Knight to come stumbling home with the speed of an uphill freight train and moved Wally Bachman over to second. It was 6-4, to four and things were getting interesting. Well, Jesse squared around and bunted Calhoun's next pitch, sacrificing Wally over to third. One out, and Lenny Dykstra was stepping up to the plate. Lenny didn't even wait to be polite. He took the first pitch he could get a piece of and put it into right field for base hit that drove Wally home and drove the lead to 7-4. to four. Any hopes we had of a really major rally, however, was dim when uh, Calhoun settled down long enough to get Mookie to hit a double play ground of that uh, closed downing inning. It was up to Jesse. With one out in the 16th, Lanier sent in the veteran Davey Lopes to face Jesse, and Lopes drew a walk. Next up was Bill Duran, who pounded a single to center, sending Lopes to second. Tied up was up next and got a base hit off Jesse, who at least kept him from hitting it into the seats. But Lopes had crossed the plate and the score was 7-5 to five with only one out men on first and second. Our infield came to the rescue in the next play. Denny Walling's grounder was eventually flipped over to Rafael Santana at second to nip Billy Hatcher for the second out while Duran moved to third. They still had a tying runs on base and a potential winning run in Glenn Davis who was coming up to the plate. 
the Astrodome was alive with screaming fans. Glenn Davis dropped a blue pit in front of Dykstra that drove in Duran and cut a lead to one run with, with two down and men on first and second. Kevin Bass stepped up to the plate. The slide of the cheapest, dinkiest, dumpiest pitch in all of baseball. That's what Gary wanted, and that's what Jesse threw. Three of them were balls, two of them were strikes. Mama, I can't take this anymore, I said to myself, ready to leap over the wall if I had to in order to go home and go to bed. Then he threw the sixth pitch, and Kevin Bass swung with all his might. I heard the sound of the ball hitting Gary Carter's glove. Kevin had missed Jesse's sixth slider. We had won the National League pennant, not with a thunderous crash, not even with a bang, but with a sudden whoosh of air, and the air was oh so sweet. As crazy as it all was, and as heady as our victory was, the emotional cost of getting there was especially high for me. During the heat of competition, you put aside all other worries in your life. I was also drinking to blot out the physical pain of having to go out there every night and work muscles that were past a point of strain. Like the rest of the guys, I just pushed through it all until the pain wasn't there anymore. I don't know firsthand who else might have been abusing which substances, but uh, months later, Doc went to Smithers to recover from cocaine addiction. If he was using cocaine during the series, I wouldn't have been surprised in the least because the pressure was so intense. It made everybody do crazy, crazy things. When my wife Lisa stepped into that world, she was blown out. I didn't want to fight with her or with anybody else for that matter. Memories were flooding back now, images of that night. What had I done? There was no thinking, no, no weighing consequences, not even a drop of human kindness, nada. Only an instant flash, an autonomic nervous system reaction, and Lisa was getting up from the floor, cupping both hands around her nose as tears ran down her cheeks and through her fingers, frantically rummaging around for ice, cursing me and everything about me, and jamming whatever she owned into whatever bag she could find. Then I was alone, and then we won game six, and then I thought I might have the time to think about being alone, but I didn't. By now, Lisa had probably moved in with her mother, I told myself. I, I actually lost track of time. We were in Houston, then I was in New York, then she was in California, and soon we'd, we'd be in Boston to begin the World Series. Too many cities, too many lives to keep track of, and I was very much alone. I'd gotten my dream, but I'd never realized what it would cost to get it. Ron Darling opened for us in the first game and seemed settled and in control for the first four innings, striking out the power of the Boston order and settled easily into a deal with Bruce Hurst. Somebody finally scored in that game. Jim Rice scored on Timmy Tuffermera when he let a ground ball go through his legs. We were in such a coma in the dugout that we didn't even know we'd lost. Actually, we didn't know the game had started. Davey tried to whip us up and we kept on saying, but it's Boston. Davey kept on talking about a bad moon on the rise, but we didn't know what the hell he was talking about. We lost game two, nine to three. Wade Boggs, Billy Buckner, Marty Barrett hit Doc Hart, and Rick Aguilera didn't need to do much better. Nor did El Cid. It was a disaster. Everything we'd accomplished all season was unraveling right before our eyes. On the evening of that third game, oil can Boyd looked into the eyes of the Mets batters. Two pitches into the first inning, Lenny Dykstra belted a home run into the right field stands. Here it comes. Before Mr. Boyd could even think about getting it together, we'd given up a single to Wally Backman, another single to Keith Hernandez, and a hard double to Gary Carter that drove in Backman and moved Keith to third. We were ahead two to nothing with none out. Oil Can was staggering around the mound like he'd just gone around with Tyson. Oil Can didn't even know where he was. Whatever had gotten to Du Bois' pitching was affecting the entire Boston team. My turn. Watch this, guys. See that green wall over there? Just watch this. I barely even looked up at Ray Knight, who passed me coming out of an on-deck circle. I stood looking at the dugout floor, my back to the field. I could feel Davies Johnson's eyes burning into me. Knight tipped the slow grounder down the third base line, and, and time seemed to stand still again. It was going to break Boston's way and end our little rally, or so I, it seemed. But Wade Boggs scooped up the ball and threw to catcher Rich Gedman to make the play on Hernandez, who had broken for home. At the same time, Gary Carter was on his way to third. Gedman chased Keith back towards third and then threw back to Boggs, but Keith slid headfirst safely back to the bag. Boggs then threw to shortstop Spike Owens and nabbed Carter on his way back to second. Carter stopped and was in a rundown. Suddenly, Keith Hernandez faked the break for the plate. Owen turned to throw home. Keith returned to third, and in that moment, Gary made it back to second. Well, Davy Johnson was jubilant, jumping up and down at the teamwork between Keith and Gary. See that? See that? He kept on screaming in the dugout. You gotta believe. Raynard, of course, was safely at first, and uh, bases were loaded on what scorecard said was a fielder's choice. Up to the plate steps our designated hitter. After all, this is an American League Park. Danny Heap who lines a first pitch right over second base for a clean single. Keith and Gary score, and Ray advances to second. Mookie 
then strikes out, and Raphael Santana bounces one to Wade Boggs, who makes the play and he for second to end the inning. So we're all up for four runs, and I'm cheering as we go out there to shut the Red Sox down. The Sox scored a run in the third, and Bobby Ojeda did the rest of the job for us, which would help from Roger McDowell, who came on in the eighth. We scored three more runs late in the game, and we went back to Fenway the next night, only one game down. you got to focus on the game tonight, Straw, not on your problems, Davey said to me privately before the start of the third game. Whatever it is, it's got to go on the shelf until the series is over. What else could I do but not? I was trying. I, I was trying so hard my brain was hurting. I even told myself I wouldn't drink, wouldn't go out on the town so as I, I could keep my head clear. I was near the end of my rope. I knew Davey was near the end of his rope, too. If I walked through another game, my ass would be out of there, and uh, there was nothing I could do about it. Damn, I hated our woman would mess up your concentration. If she had only waited until after the playoffs, we could have worked all this out. Instead, she pulled the trigger and then split. I couldn't blame her, though, only, only myself. And that was a problem. I had to put it away and concentrate on baseball. Well, Gary Carter got us rolling in game four when he belted a two-run homer off Al Nipper over the big green monster left field, bouncing it off the screen and leaving the Boston fans gasping for air while the thousands of Mets fans had driven up the fence, we were screaming. We're up now two to nothing. Do it for you, Dal, Davey said to me. Pressure's off. We're already ahead. He was wrong, but the psychology was appreciated. There's sometimes more pressure to join a winning team than to create a winning team. I was already writing this series off because I couldn't whip up that emotion. Then I saw Nipper's pitch curve away at just the right speed for crack. The fans leapt to their feet as the ball soared into the left field and bounced off the green monster, and I was standing in second with a double. Then Ray lined the next pitch right over Nepper's head for the base hit, and I took off like a rocket. I didn't look like anything except third base coach Buddy Harrison as he waved me to go home. I didn't stop running until I was in the dugout steps and high-fiving everybody I could find. I was run number three, and we were finally getting it together again right here at Fenway. After Gary Carter hit another home run into the screen and left, the game ended at 6-2, to two, the New York Mets. Now the World Series was tied at two games apiece. In Game 5, Bruce Hurst scattered 10 hits through the 9 innings, allowing us only one run in the 8th and another in the ninth. Meanwhile, the Red Sox jumped all over Doc, who had to be relieved in the 5th. Boston won the game 4-2. to two. Down 3-2, to two, we had to face Roger Clemens in Game 6. Game 6, the day the world stood still. History, drama, art. It needs an epic rap to recreate it, not just a few lines of sports writers' prose. You have to perform it, not just describe it. Bobby Oeder in the top of the first, throwing his pitches with a furious thirst. Says, I'm not Lendl and Clemens ain't Mac. The Mets will take that momentum back. Davey felt his numbers pounding in his brain, roaring through the tunnel like a seven train. Well, on the top of the first, leadoff swing and Wade Boggs single off Ray Knight's glove. Bobby got rid of the next two batters, but then Evans lined a long double into left that scored Boggs. One to nothing, Beantown. One to nothing, Boston. Well, the Sox got another run in the top of the two, and I almost made a terrible error, but recovered just in time to catch Billy Buckner's fly to right field. They walked me in the second inning, these stupid SOBs, and I stole second. See that, Davey? Heads up baseball. See that? But Davey was looking. He was bummed because Carey had flied out before I got up, and Ray Knott and Mookie Wilson both struck out afterwards. Not good, fellas. Bobby O throws deuces, curving down and in. Whiffs Jim Rice and Gedwin with his deadly spin. Bobby buzzing b-balls, never seen but heard, blowing by the Bow Sox in the top of the third. Davey felt his numbers pounding in his brain, roaring through the tunnel like a seven train. Well, Davey Johnson was screwing up his face in a frown and twisting the end of his mustache. Then in the fifth inning, Darrell draws the walk while waiting for his pitch. Then he steals second like a son of a bitch. Knight, Mookie, Mookie single right over first. Darrell streaks home like a lightning burst. Evans out in right field bobbles like a nerd looking for the ball. He lets Knight take third. Heaps double play cuts Knights loose. Ray's trucking home and it's all tied at deuce. Now Davey sees the numbers playing in his brain, roaring through the psyche like a seven train. In the seventh, Davey pulled Bobby O for Roger McDowell who walked Monty Barrett. Barrett eventually scored after an error in a double play attempt and that put Boston up by one. In our half of the seventh, we did nothing. In the eighth inning, McDowell got into trouble again. With two outs and the bases loaded, Davey pulled Roger for Jesse Orozco, who put out the fire by getting Bill Buck in the fly to Lenny Dykstra in center. Then in the eighth, Fortune crossed the field. First in the top of the inning, Clemens developed a blister on his pitching hand, and McNamara moved, removed him for a pinch swinger. So the bottom of the inning, Calvin Chiraldi was on the mound. Davey sent Lee Mazzelli up to bat for Jesse Orozco. Lee bounced a hard single to the right on Chiraldi's first pitch. Lenny Dykstra trying to sacrifice Mazzilli to second, bunted right back at the mound, but Chiraldi threw late to second, and Lee and Lenny were both safe. First and second with no outs. 
Wally Bachman moved up both runners with a sacrifice bunt, so McNamara had Keith Hernandez walk intentionally to load the bases. Then on a 3-0 count, Gary Codd hit a line drive to deep left field that was caught, but allowed uh, Lee Mazzilli to score and Lenny Dykstra to take third. One in, two out, game tied three apiece. David Johnson gave me the hairy eyeball as I walked through the batter's box from the on-deck circle. Fans are shouting Darrell, all in shades of din. Sherrod looks around the bases, pitches down and in. Fans are shouting Darrell, I got to hit the ball. Lisa's out in Altadena, she won't take my call. Davies in the dugout, give me the glare. I close my eyes and take a swing, but all I hit is air. Now I hear them booing, why did she leave town? I had a fly snag deep in center and close the rally down. Lee, take right, Straw, take rest. You chase the sucker pitch. I need guys now to hit the ball, not wallow in the ditch. Now I see how numbers flash in Davies' brain, roaring through my eardrums like the Seven train. I like to describe the rest of the game for you, but I, I didn't see it. I can describe what the ground looks like in the Mets dugout at Shea because I got to know it pretty well during those two innings when the whole world was watching the most improbable ending ever in a World Series game. The fans who watched that game on television got wonderful close-up shots of me. Some say sulking, others say pouting, others say crying slumped in the dugout. Rick Aguilera blanked the Bow Sox in their ninth, and Calvin Chiraldi did the same to us in the bottom of the inning. By the 10th, I was still pretty miserable because it seemed the whole world had turned against me at what should have been one of my proudest moments. I'll never drink again, I promised myself. I begged her to come back. I promised myself I'll do anything. When Dave Henderson hit a home run deep into the left field stand to lead off Boston's 10th, you could hear the rustling of fans moving towards the exits. I was thinking about going for the exit myself. The whole year, I told myself, was about to end in the 10th inning of Game 6 after I'd been pulled because my brain was somewhere else. With two out, Wade Boggs doubled the left and Marty Barrett singled the center, scoring Boggs. It was 5-3 to three Boston before Rick Aguilera could put the fire out, but it seemed it was already too late. Well, maybe not. Leading off the bottom of the 10th, Wally Bachman hit a fly ball that drove Jim Rice back a few feet before he caught it and left. Then Mex hit a long drive that looked like it had possibilities for a couple of seconds until Henderson got under it right near the warning track in center field and brought it in. Davey was probably pissed, too, as he watched Gary caught a foul one off take two balls from Chiraldi, and then belt a single to the left. I look, looked up, still sulking, but aware that something might be happening. Davey sent in Kevin Mitchell a bat for Rick Aguilera. Hey, this was for the Bobbles, right? Davey wasn't missing any chances. Kevin had one strike, and then when he drove the next pitch over second for another single. We had a tying run to the base, and Davey began to pace. Even he knew that the game might just be heading into strange waters. Ray Knight waited until he had two strikes on him, the blooper single in the center that scored Gary Carter and advanced Mitchell all the way to third. Now the tying run was on third and the winning run was on first. McNamara had had enough. He replaced uh, Chiraldi with Bob Stanley. Too late, the fans began calling for the impossible as their favorite player came to the plate. Fans are screaming Mookie. Gotta make it rain. Mookie, Mookie, Mookie. Even up that game. Hex him, jinx him, Mookie, scare us up a run. Get Kevin Mitchell home from third before the inning's done. Mookie gives the evil eye as Stanley rears and throws. The ball then takes a wicked dip off Gedman's glove, it goes. Mitchell comes home standing up, run number five for us. Game's all tied, Knights on second, and Davey numbers bust. Mookie, 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 it sounds more like a prayer. He hits the ball towards Buckner's glove, and wait, the ball's not there. Suddenly the numbers explode in Davey's brain, lighting up the scoreboard like the seven train. Billy Buckner finally realized that the ball rolled between his legs as Ray Knight came in to score the winning run. It was the Mets 6-5, and we were all tied up at three games apiece. I looked up from the dugout floor as the field exploded and people were rushing around everywhere as the fire had broken out. And I, I uttered a promise to anyone in hearing distance, I'll play my heart out tomorrow night and I'll go back to California and another shot at doing things right. I believe in magic, I saw it work. On the next day, a storm rolled up the Atlantic coast that rained out game seven. Maybe John McNamara still felt he had a little luck left as he looked up the gray New York rain from inside his hotel room. Now Bruce Hurst would get the extra day's rest he needed to pitch the final game in his third appearance in the World Series. How many other pitchers have won three times in a World Series? I don't know if McNamara had the figures in his head, but Davey did. It's a rare, rare occurrence, he told us. It's rare enough that I, I don't put any stock in the numbers. He's working against law of averages, only he doesn't know it. And I'll tell you a secret of life, fellas. If a man thinks that he's working with the numbers when he's really working against numbers, then you got him. Does that mean we win, we asked Davey? It means you don't have to be afraid of Bruce Hurst or anybody. Bruce Hurst is vulnerable, and you guys are the folks who will show him just how vulnerable. The numbers really, really lie, but when they do, it's for a good reason. But Davey wasn't Mr. Mello in the bottom of the second inning of Game 7. Darling took leadoff batter Evans to a 3-2 count, and then Evans took him over the left field wall for a home run. 
I wasn't happy at all when the next batter, Gedman, hit a stupid fly to right that uh, I wound up knocking over the right field wall for another home run. That didn't endear me to the hometown fans. The Sox still weren't finished in the second inning. Wade Boggs singled to score Monty Barrett, and the Sox ended that inning up 3 to nothing. We had to make trouble. Well, after Boston went down 1-2-3 in the top of the sixth, Davey decided to turn a hitting machine on. He had replaced Darling with Sid Fernandez in the fourth, and now he pulled El Sid out for a pinch swing at Lee Mazzilli. It was the right choice because Lee drilled a single through the gap between second and third, and Mookie Wilson followed with a single right over Wade Boggs' head. All the guys in our dugout were on their feet. Hey, it was the seventh game, and Davey knew that we could win it all. This was what we had waited through 84 and 85 to experience, and Davey was telling us not to let down the fans who had supported us last year. This was to be our tribute to them. Well, to my eyes, Hurst seemed to be tiring quickly and losing his control. He walked Timmy Tuffle to load the bases, and Keith Hernandez, seething mad and full of power, walked up from the on-deck circle. Keith showed Hurst no respect whatsoever. He sent his second pitch deep in the left center for a long single that scored both Mazzilli and Mookie. Timmy went to third, and Davies sent Wally Backman to pinch run for him. Well, Gary Carter's blooper to right scored Wally, but Keith was tagged out at second, Evans to Owen. Then I belted a line drive towards Jim Rice and left that I thought would drop in for a hit, but he made a diving grab. The inning was over, but we had three runs and a tied ball game. Well, in the seventh inning, Roger McDowell relieved El Cid and retired the Red Sox 1-2-3. In the bottom of the inning, McNamara sent Calvin Chiraldi in for Hurst, who had been pulled for a pinch hitter. Our leadoff batter was Ray Knight, who had been hitting like a machine during this series. Chiraldi wasn't ready for Ray's incredible intensity. Knight fouled off the first pitch and then took two balls. He knew he had the edge. He hit Chiraldi's next pitch over the left center field wall to put us in the lead by a run. Dykstra pinch hitting for Kevin Mitchell then hit a single. Advanced a second on a wild pitch to Santana by a very tired, nervous Chiraldi. Everybody could see he wasn't long for the game. Raphael Santana kept that rally going with another single, which scored Dykstra. McDowell then moved Santana over to second in the sacrifice bunt. McNamara had had enough and pulled Chiraldi for Joe Sambito, who walked Mookie intentionally and Wally unintentionally to load the bases. The Sox were looking for a double play to close the inning, but Keith Hernandez found his range and took a Sambito pitch deep to left center for a sacrifice fly that scored Santana. McNamara pulled Sambito for Bob Stanley, and the both Sox looked like they were in a panic. Well, Staley got Carter on the ground and retired his side, but uh, we had picked up three runs and led 6-3. to three. At least we looked like the first-place team that had beaten the Astros, a team that now odds makers had picked to win the series. At last, we were playing like winners. In the top of the eighth, Boston mounted a rally against McDowell, throwing a dramatic scare into the Mets fans at Shea and watching on television. Billy Buckner and Jim Rice led off with singles, and Dwight Evans doubled, scoring both runners. Whoops! No one out, tying run in scoring position. Time for the firemen. Well, Davey Johnson brought in Jesse Orozco and gave him his final instructions just by a look in the eye. Jesse got Rich Gedman to line out to Wally Bachman at second. He struck out Dave Henderson, and he got Don Baylor pin swinging for Spike Owen to wrap an easy bounce at Raphael Santana at shortstop. The side was out. Thank you, Jesse. Well, John McNamara brings an Al, my new pal, Nipper, to face me. I welcomed him back to Shea with a home run blast, and the pass went right over the right center field wall. As I rounded second in a slow, slow trot while waving to the screams of the 55,000 Met fans, I saw David look ready to jump up and down. Now we were ahead by two, seven to five. Al Nipper had barely recovered from the earthquake that had just rocked Shea when Ray Knight stepped up. He singled right up the middle. Lenny Dykstra then got too anxious in a lousy pitch and bounced out the short to first. One out, but Ray had advanced to second. Now McNamara decides to get fancy. He had Raphael Santana uh, intentionally walk to get to Jesse Orozco and set up a force play at third. Old Jesse slices the bouncer right up the middle for a base hit that scores Ray Knight for another insurance run. We now lead 8-5, to five, and now it's the top of the ninth, and it's all on the shoulders of Jesse Orozco. Jesse bears down on Boston's Ed Romero with a look of controlled fury. He delivers a snake of a pitch that Romero chases and pops to Keith Hernandez who makes the play in foul territory. Then Jesse's cheapest slider tricks Ray Boggs into bouncing a high chop at a Wally Bachman at second, who throws to Keith at first for the second out. It's breath-holding time. Monty Barrett steps up to the plate. How many Red Sox fans are joying about the Boston curse at that very moment, complaining about the Mets' magic and the luck of Davey Johnson? How many fans spitting on bar stools in Sunnyside, Queens, or watching TV in the living rooms and the huge housing projects along Lenox Avenue or sitting in taverns from Old Lyme to Poughkeepsie to Sag Harbor to Bayhead Junction to Lawrenceville were not even daring to take a bad drink as whiz for fear of missing the last of the series? How many people were watching the look in your eyes, Jesse, as you went into your final lineup? With strike three, we were laughing and crying at the same time. 
This was my greatest moment, and yet something invisible was still holding me back as the rest of the world of New York sports fans wept tears of absolute joy. I was feeling strangely empty, dangerously hungry, needy, and unfulfilled. I could already feel the pain that was waiting for me in California. I didn't like it, but I couldn't stop it. Evil was at work throwing long shadows across my triumph like the coming of night. On the flight home to California after the series, I knew that the troubles with Lisa weren't going to end. We, we got back together again during Christmas in our New York condo where we tried to piece our marriage back together. But there were too many demons, too many bad feelings. Lisa didn't want to be in New York. She wanted us to live in California. I wanted to live in New York. I was a champion. We got into another violent fight. There are different versions of, the, of that fight, but in divorce papers she filed later in Los Angeles in January 1987, Lisa charged that I hit her with a brass picture frame that I threw at her. I told her then and told her later that uh, that was an accident, but at the time she was in no mood to believe me. Lisa didn't stay around to fight with me any longer. We needed to be separate for a while, and, and she uh, moved back to California to stay at her mother's house in Altadena. I wasn't happy about that and followed her to California to try to talk to her. I didn't know where we were going as a couple. Our lives were coming apart so quickly, but I didn't want to make the same mistakes with her and little Darrell Jr. that my father had made with my mother and us. Once we were on the way down, though, no thoughts of my mother and father or fights down in Crenshaw were enough to break our fall. I was drinking very heavily in the winter before spring training camp opened. I was an alcoholic, but uh, wouldn't realize or admit it until January, three years later. By the time I went to Port St. Lucie, I felt like a walking disaster. To add to my confusion, Doc was being packed off to Smithers for rehab. Seeing Doc disappear behind the walls of Smithers like he'd been swallowed up was a scary thing because I knew I was on the same track, even I wasn't admitting it to myself at the time. I told myself that booze was different from blow, but in my heart I knew that I was sliding down the same chute. The shadows of night were getting close, and despite the heat down in Florida, I was feeling the chill. By March, things in my life had gone from bad to worse. The press had gotten hold of Lisa's complaint. It was, after all, a public document. It's bad enough to have to fight out your domestic problems using lawyers, but to fight them out in public is another matter. And things weren't coming, coming together in the Mets either. The team seemed to be coasting on its victories from the previous season and not putting together a winning team for the coming campaign. Now I can understand that I was out of control because I didn't have a clue about dealing with my problems. When I felt the burden of what was happening on the team or with my career or with Lisa weighing down upon me, I'd either go out drinking or open a bottle of rum and drink it at home. Drinking had become my way of dealing, my way of forgetting what I had to face. The people at Smithers would eventually say I was medicating myself with alcohol. But now I know that it was the demons, the unearthly spirits that had taken control of me and were living on my fury. Once I excised them, I was able to see it all. I got into a fight with the teammates during 1987 because I believed I was the only person on the club who, who cared about winning when the season started. Then when I stopped caring during the first two months of the season, the whole club turned on me as if I were working out for the enemy. That's what happens when you lay yourself out for someone else, realize you're acting like a fool because the other person doesn't care, pull back, and then take a knock because you refuse to extend yourself any longer. Part of it was racial. I know I have to have the strongest back in the team so I can carry everybody. But uh, another part of it was the whole nature of being an alcoholic. You know, there was a double standard on the Mets, and, and that's for sure. The Mets were resting on their laurels and still recovering from the intensity of the previous year. That's also true. But I know that if I could only looked at the, my behavior in 1987 with the eyes I have in 1991, I would have just seen how destructive my alcoholism was and what the earthly spirits that were holding me down were doing to my career and my relationship with the other players. The end of the season was as frustrating as the beginning. During that bleak September of 1987, no matter what I did to keep the Mets' drive going, our defense and offense conspired to lose the games. So now it's the end of the Mets' 1987 season, and I've hit 39 home runs and stolen 36 bases. I'm in the 30-30 club for the first time in my career. I have a 284 batting average, my best year for average in the majors, and 104 runs batted in. But what about the team? We drifted around on the first division for most of the season while winning 92 games and losing 70. Not bad, of course, but nothing like the numbers of the previous season. Still, there's not one word of acknowledgement for the real Darryl Strawberry, the person who is not the media-created monster of the Mets who has to put his life in order. That person feels pain, gets hungover, still wants desperately to have a family, and would have only truly appreciated some personal support from someone on the team. But there was none. You put your bat down at the end of the season and head west for five months of domestic warfare before you head back to Florida to pick up where you left off. 
The only breaks came at night when I would nod off to sleep after drinking rum until there was no more pain. I was an emotional cripple as the season ended for us in ashes. Not only had it been a bad year for the team, but uh, it was a year during which I had lost myself completely. I had no wife, no child, and a career as a professional villain. I had fallen into the same patterns as my father has had if he hadn't had a choice. Now everything about me was in ruins. I needed a miracle. I needed a path out. But as the new year came and I looked forward to flying south to Florida, all I could see ahead of me was despair. May 1988 would be a better year, but for the life of me, I couldn't see how. With all my frustration from the previous year and my misguided family expectations still building up, I burst into spring training camp like a person who was possessed. I wanted to hit every ball out of the park, steal every base that wasn't covered, and catch every fly to the outfield no matter what it was. But it backfired, and I was in the same rut again I had been in in 1987. Worse, I was looking at the same tired faces that had been carried off the field last year. I was absolutely nuts. Still, by that June, we were in first place by four and a half games, and it looked like a repeat of the 1986 season. Lisa and I had reconciled, and I told her that I really wanted to stay married after all. I promised her that we would settle down, buy a nice house in California, and honestly try to make a go of it. We we're still living in New York at the same time. She conceived our second child in the fall of 1987. Right about that time, she was giving birth. However, we were beginning to lose our grip on first place. Davy excused me from the game that night because Lisa had gone into labor and I took off from Pittsburgh for New York. Lisa gave birth to our little girl the following morning. I was a father again. You know, when you have a new little baby, it's as if the whole world starts all over again. And it's as if your marriage starts all over again and you get another chance to do it right. I saw my baby all kicking and squirming in a hospital bassinet and actually felt a burst of, well, responsibility. She was precious as precious as a diamond, and that's what we named her, Diamond Nicole. I felt charged up with a new power. I was Super D. Nothing's too hard for me. Yes, I want to say with Lisa and Diamond Nicole, but we were fighting a war out there, and I was going into battle. Yes, so even though Davey had excused me from the next game, I wanted to get back into the action and hit a few baseballs. Bring him on. I'm a daddy again. I'll show him. I flew back to Pittsburgh that afternoon where, in uh, honor of my new daughter, I put a ball out of the park and, and we beat the Pirates 5-2. to two. We beat them again the next night and went back to Shea with a nice five-and-a-half game cushion in first place. That was a shift in high gear than we needed to let us cruise along in first place for the rest of the season. When the season ended, we led the Eastern Division by 15 games and moved into the National League Championship Series against the L.A. Dodgers. Most of the Mets saw our playoffs against the Dodgers coming in as a replay of our 1986 League Championship Series against the Houston Astros. It wasn't. This time, the Dodgers had the drive we should have had. The Dodgers' Oral Hershey's was relentless in the first game. They scored a runoff dock in the bottom of the first, another in the seventh, while Oral made us chase balls all over the strike zone and then some for eight full innings. Even the hometown fans were beginning to yawn. Nothing we could do would start a rally. Then came the ninth. With one out and Greg Jeffries on second, I powdered a double into the gap that scored one run. At that point, Jay Howell came in for Hershiser. He walked McReynolds to put Matt on first and second, and then struck out Hojo for the second out. Gary Carter chose that moment to come alive with a sinking blooper to John Shelby in center field. The sports writers like to call those shots tweenies because they're too far out for the second baseman or shortstop and too far in for the center fielder. Shelby, I know because that was in base at the time. He thought he had a play in the ball as he charged from center field. From my angle, I knew he had no play. Shelby flew in and stretched himself flat to catch Carter's blooper, but it dropped in front of him as he fell flat in his face. By the time he recovered, two runs had scored and we were up on the Dodgers 3-2. to two. We closed him down in the ninth and that was game one for the Mets. Game two, which should have been ours, was a Dodgers rumble. Their pitcher, Timmy Belcher, spread out three runs over nine innings while L.A. kicked to Davey Cones' ass right out of the stadium and across Route 101. Game three now in New York was a pine tar game. You know, using pine tar is technically not the same thing as roughing up a ball or razoring its skin, but it can get your butt kicked out of a contest. The pine tar question actually came up much earlier in the year. Davey Johnson had intimated that he thought there was something odd about the way Jay Howell's pitches broke. They consistently broke too hard to be normal pitches. Howell, he thought, was putting something on the ball. Pine saw was the obvious substance because pitchers had been using it since the turn of the century. So Davey put the word out to watch Howell's hands and glove, especially when he put them behind his back. 
Our first base coach, Bill Robinson, said he saw Jay Howell pulling at the leather strings on the back of his glove during game three. Other players noticed Howell's glove strings looked a little too dark to be on the up and up. It looked like pine tar to them. So Bill Robinson gives Davey the high sign, but uh, Davey holds his cards. He wants to use the edge he thinks he has when it can have the most dramatic effect. He plays it cool and waits for his numbers, waits until Howell has a full count on Kevin Reynolds leading off the bottom of the eighth, but the Dodgers ahead 4-3. to three. On this cold, damp afternoon at Shea, the tension is good and high. Then Davey struts onto the field and motions for the home plate ump, Joe West. Look it over, ump, he says. West and crew chief Harry Wendelstadt gave the ball a once-over. Wendelstadt tosses Jay Howell out of the game and hands Howell's glove to National League President Bart Giamatti. Meanwhile, the Dodgers' number one reliever is out of the game, and there's still a 3-2 to two count on McReynolds. The Met fans at Shea start to scream, Cheaters! at the Dodgers in the outfield. Hey, it's better than booing me. When Alejandro Pena comes in, he walks Kevin, and the Mets start a five-run rally like Cap with a two-run single. We win 8-4, to four, and now we have the momentum back. We lead now two games to one. The Dodgers turned the whole playoff series around for themselves in the game four when they came from behind to tie it up in the top of the nine, four to four, and finish us off with another run in the 12th. Well, that was what the Mets would have done in 1986. Game four was particularly a frustrating game for me. Well, the Dodgers started off the game by taking a two-run lead in top of the first. We had a big three-run fourth in which both McReynolds and I, and I homered. In the sixth, McReynolds led off with a double into center and was immediately driven home by a Gary Carter triple, giving us a 4-2 to two lead. I smelled trouble, however, when uh, Timmy Tuffle then struck out with Gary on third. Timmy should have brought Gary home. Kevin Elster was intentionally walking. Doc wasn't looking over his pitches when he hit into a double play that ended the inning. There were butterflies in my stomach. You don't have a leave a run on the third with none out, even when you're up uh, by two and expect to win playoff games. I was proven right in the top of the ninth when Mike Sosha two-run homer tied the score. The score stayed until Kurt Gibson homered off McDowell in the 12th to uh, break the tie. We couldn't do diddly in our 12th, and the Dodgers had tied us at two games apiece. We were sinking. Well, Timmy Belcher all but shut me down in the game five of the next night at Shea when the Dodgers beat us 7-4 to four by simply overpowering us. We were hardly in the game. So back in L.A. for game six, I hit sort of. I, I got a single. I might have hit more, but Tim Larry kept walking me. Uh, Kevin McReynolds came alive for us that night with a home run, and the Dodgers made two errors, and we beat them 5-1 to one to tie the playoffs at three apiece. Knowing what you know now, you wouldn't think we'd have been confident facing Horrell Urshires in Game 7. You wouldn't think that at all, but we had done all right against him in Game 3 and believed that we'd hit his best stuff again. For nine innings on the night of October 12, Oral Hershey's was the toughest pitcher I've ever seen in my life. He seemed to draw power from somewhere, now I know where, and frustrated us completely. He never gave our hitters a chance to show how much power we had. A few times we connected with the ball, it went right where he wanted it to go as if he were drawn by magnets or strings. Davy Johnson just sat there in the dugout dumbfounded. He knew Hershey's was good, he just didn't know how good he was. I had to tip my hat to the Dodgers and the L.A. fans after Oral struck me out in the sixth inning. It was all I could do. My friends were in the stands. My family was in the stands. Everybody I knew was rooting for the Dodgers and rooting for me at the same time. I wanted us to win so badly, but Hershey's made us look like a bunch of amateurs. After the game, I sat down in front of my lock and cried like a baby. Nothing anybody could say could ease my feelings of failure at having lost a National League championship right in front of my own mother, brothers, and sisters. I knew that on paper the Mets were far stronger than the Dodgers and we could have beaten Oakland or any other American League team. But it struck me during the series that no matter how hard I tried, the Dodgers has a team were more committed to winning than the Mets. That really shook me. The Dodgers were so driven, so pushed, so focused on winning that they simply took away from the overconfident Mets what rightfully should have been their National League championship. That's why I was crying. In early 1989, I began to get a more accurate picture of what had been happening to me on the Mets, and by uh, then it was truly too late. My new agent, Eric Goldschmidt, and I had been talking since the end of 1988 about seeking a contract extension from the Mets to cover 1990, my option year under the free agency rules, and beyond. Well, through Eric, I asked the Mets to sweeten the final contract year deal, 1989, and my option year deal, 1990. I wanted an extension, and I wanted a new salary to reflect the role that I was playing on the ball club. The Mets were very reluctant to begin any discussions while the 89 contract was still in place. The press jumped on me. I was suddenly an ingrate. The entire team seemed to turn on me, too. Who is Dale Strawberry that he thinks he can renegotiate a contract that's already in force? The whole situation erupted at a team picture session at Port St. Lucie in March. Here's what happened. 
Well, weeks before the fight, Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter had been writing me about my wanting to reopen my contract. All of this was kind of a tit-for-tat after my comments the year before. They began saying that Strawberry was a crybaby for wanting to open his contract now and for sulking around the clubhouse while Cash and company were deciding what to do. Then on March 1st, I told some reporters at the camp that if the Mets didn't give Eric Goldschmidt the consideration of sitting down and talking with him about extending my current contract, that I was going to walk out of camp. If I couldn't have the courtesy of the kind of treatment I thought I deserved, then I didn't want to be part of the Mets, period. Well, the next day we were supposed to pose for a team picture session. Keith and Gary had been having a high old time telling reporters that they thought I was a baby and, and going on my need for additional money. Right before the picture session, I walked up to Hernandez and, and Carter and told them I didn't comment on their contracts and didn't interfere with their negotiations with the ball club. So what the hell were they doing getting into my way of my money and my business? Contract talks are one of the truly private issues that players have with their teams. What gave Carter Hernandez the right to intervene in my contract talks and breach about what everybody considers to be my private issue? I told him that I was sick and tired of it being treated like a second-class citizen on the Mets by people who should be supporting me instead of sniping at me. We're all tired of this baby stuff, they said. Fuck you, baby stuff. It's my money. That's when I lost my temper, and before anybody realized it, Keith and I were swinging at one another. Our teammates got between us and pulled me away to the delight of the assembled cameramen who were rolling, rolling away their videotapes and film and kept on rolling as I stormed off the field. I walked out of camp the next day and was promptly fined $750. I told David that I'd be back the next day and would play out my option year, but enough was enough. I was leaving after 1990 because I had had it with the crummy treatment I'd gotten from the ball club. The next day, we had an exhibition a game against the Dodgers, who were the world champions and who had been beating us in 1988 for the National League Championship. As I ran onto the field, the fans booed me something fierce. Well, that hurt. They weren't booing me for not getting a hit or dropping a ball. They were booing me for standing up for myself. This had become a personal issue. When I heard the booze coming back upon me, I, I realized I had to do something about it fast. So I, I tipped my hat to the stands, ran back past first base, hugged Keith, and gave him the biggest, wettest Roger Rabbit kiss I could. Smack! I slobbered all over the son of a bitch. The fans loved it. The paper was photographed it. Keith tensed in terror. Well, Daryl Strawberry missed the showbiz. When it was my turn to pick up the bat, I belted a home run off Tim Belcher. It traveled so far, they saw it flying over Cuba. He wiped his slate clean with one swing, Davey Johnson said to reporters afterwards, and that summed up my relationship with the New York Mets. As long as I was hitting home runs, driving base runners home, and giving the fans a show, I was entitled to my share of the accolades, but just as soon as I stepped out of line, I was no good. I took a good hard look at the Mets after I began seeing the world in terms of black and white. I compared the Mets to the Yankees and I saw that despite the George Steinbrenner's public brouhaha's with Reggie Jackson and Dave Winfield, he would still feel five to seven regular black ball players during the season while the Mets had only Doc and myself on a regular basis. You know, when you're black in this sport, you begin to hear rumors about how you have to be better than the white players on your team and just to get the same kind of contract. And you hear managers don't like to play their black players too much because they have to give them much more money. Money. But most players dismiss these rumors because they don't want to think that after all these years and after 20 years of the civil rights movement and other advances, you're still being judged on your color. But then one day you look around and you begin to have a different outlook on the team you're playing for. You know, it seemed to me that the Mets had fewer blacks on their team than most of the other major league teams, and uh, they had signed precious few black ball players. They decided they were not going to pay Daryl Strawberry one thin dime more than he agreed to for his final and uh, option year. But I was convinced that if I had been a different color, it would have been all different. If Frank Cashin had once taken the time to sit down with me, either in 1989 or in 1990, to explain why he was not going to renegotiate my contract, I would have understood. If he would have only said once that he wanted me to remain with the Mets, but that re renegotiating my contract would have meant renegotiating all the contracts, I would have understood that too. Had I been in this position, dealing with a player like me who had uh, shown so much immaturity in the past, I would have taken the time to let that player know how much he meant to the organization, but how much the organization had to adhere to certain bargaining principles with all the players, regardless of their race or background. I would have bought that hook, line, and sinker because I was looking for that kind of communication. I needed the support of the Mets family. I craved it. I wanted to stay in the Mets if they had stepped forward and said the magic words, Darrell, we want you, we love you, one of us, you, you belong here, but we can't pay the dough you want. Work with us and help us find a solution because we're all together on this. I probably would have started crying just like a little kid because I thought I'd found the approval I was looking for. But the Mets taught me a hard lesson. 
Business is business. Emotions play no role. It was a bit, a bit of pill for me to swallow, and I, I didn't digest it for another 18 months. But at the time in 1989, they put all the signals to me that they didn't want me to stay in the ball club, and still that's the hardest thing in the world for me to accept. Well, after all the trials of spring training in 1989, we blasted St. Louis 8-4 to four to open the season. But after two weeks, we'd lost six out of eight, had chalked up only three wins since opening day, and we were dead last. Well, the press hooted, and we were thoroughly embarrassed because we'd been the first-place team in the East the year before. Davy Johnson issued an ultimatum in the clubhouse. You're, uh, you're, you'll cut playing cards, he said, and no more golf games. You guys are playing lackluster baseball. You're the best team in the East. Start playing like it. Then to add injury to insult, I got hurt in April when I uh, overswung on a Steve Antevero's changeup during a game with the Phillies on a cold, damp evening. I hit the pitch, but in grounding out, I tore some of the muscle fibers in my shoulder and strained the tendon. Well, the Mets trainers taped it up and gave me medication for the pain, but the medication made me groggy and I stiffened up. We went from bad to worse, and just as my right shoulder began to act up again and keep me from taking my full swing, Gary Carter's troubled knee filled up with fluid and he could barely walk, let alone play. They put him on a 15-day disable list, but when he looked at the way he was suffering, we knew that he might well be out for longer than 15 days. Then when I began to accept that pain in my shoulder might be a season long, my back began to tighten up. I knew what was happening because I was shifting my weight to adjust to the pain in my shoulder, putting added stress on my back muscles. To make matters even worse, Keith Hernandez crashed into a dodger shortstop Dave Anderson while breaking up a twin killing. He broke the play up all right, but also broke his right kneecap and had to be sidelined. Now we'd lost Carter and Hernandez, and I was playing hurt. Right around the middle of May, I was blindsided by my wife, Lisa. I guess she was tired of being alone during the season, probably tired of a lot more. She, she filed for a divorce in Los Angeles. Our marriage had been a roller coaster since 1985, even though I was sincerely trying to make the relationship work. I hadn't yet faced my drinking problems head on, nor I had uh, come to the understanding that I would eventually reach uh, regarding my relationship with the Mets and my problems with family in general. I was too focused on baseball, the eroding 1989 season, and my contract problems to think about anything else. And that was a mistake. Could things have gotten worse? Sure they could, and they did. Gary had to have surgery in his right knee and it was lost to us for most of the rest of the season. With the season gradually slipping out of our grasp with my shoulder and back healing and then hurting and with the divorce proceedings going forward without my being there to do anything to stop it, I knew I had to take some action to try to break this downward spiral. I was afraid about winding up alone with, without my family and afraid that I might let myself get into a position where I would let them down even though I didn't want to. The more I thought about that, the more I thought about my own father. I had to open a dialogue. I had to find some little piece of meaning in everything that was swirling around me, especially in the failure of my own marriage. I tried to rationalize away my feelings of hostility towards him at that first, and I said, you can't carry around grudges forever. You have to look at the realities of your own family. Well, my father was still my father no matter what, and part of him was a part of me no matter how bitter I was. I had to face that anger full on. I had to see what was behind the curtain that I'd, I'd been setting up since I was 13. I, I was feeling bad enough about life already. I might as well punch through the wall. That's when I picked up the phone and called him. I asked him how things were going and how he was getting along in life and how he was coping with things. We didn't talk about his divorce or about mine. He, he asked me how the shoulder was and whether the Mets would uh, pull out. We avoided the big elephant standing between us of what happened on the night he left the family. We just left it there, right in the room, and made believe we, we didn't see it. Sure, it was awkward at first, but we found ways around it and learned to duck the hard questions like, why did you never say a single word to me in 15 years? He must have realized that his children were good kids who had turned out good. He had seen that we uh, weren't a pack of losers or anything like that. Well, maybe he'll see it someday. Maybe he'll say something, one word even, that will let me know that I'm in a family. Maybe we keep on talking, but the elephant, it ain't moving. We had spurts of winning, but nothing changed. Then the front office shook up the lineup by trading our platoon center fielder Lenny Dykstra and the relief pitcher Roger McDowell to the Phillies of Juan Samuel. We slipped into third place in June only three or so games back, but we couldn't put together that burst of runs and pitching a winning streak that would launch us into the, into first place. We'd been able to do it in 1986 and again in 1988, and uh, we'd do it again in 92, but in 89 we were flat. Then in a game against the Montreal Expos, pitcher Kevin Gross threw a ball that hit my foot and broke my right toe. It was more pain, more frustration, more time on the bench instead of on the field. Then just as I was trying to come back, Doc complained of sharp pains in his right side when he pitched, and the doctors diagnosed that as a small muscle tear. Doc was out of the lineup. 
By the end of July, even with Gary Carter and Max Hernandez back in the lineup, we were slipping. We were in third place behind the Cubs and five games in back of the first place Expos and not playing intensely at all. We picked up Cy Young Award winner Frank Viola to toughen up the pitching rotation now that Doc would be out healing for a stretch of time. Then we gave up Mookie for Toronto Blue Jays pitcher Jeff Musselman. The whole team seemed in transition as if Cashin were determined to build a new club before the end of the year. Then there were rumors that Davey was going to go too. He had dinner with Frank one night and said afterward that he felt like it was his last meal, but Davey survived. The team managed to lurch forward at the end of the August into second place, two and a half games behind the Cubs, tied with the Cardinals, and a half game up on the Expos. Well, despite the disasters that had befallen us during the season, we were still in it. Almost on cue, we went into a September slump that to put us six or so games out by the 20th. Well, during the last week of the season, we knew that uh, it was over for us, that we were simply trying to cross the finish line so the race could count. With the onset of winter in California, Lisa and I made an attempt to reconcile again, and I moved back to the house in Encino that I had brought for the family the year before, but we only began fighting some more. I had continued speaking to my father more at my brother's urging than my own initiative, but we were still estranged. I couldn't get his problems out of my mind. I couldn't get him to understand my problems with him or with my own kids. We were like two people trying to talk to each other from behind two glass bubbles, yet I wanted desperately to communicate with him. He had the answers. He has the answers. I knew that I I began talking it out with Lisa again. Maybe she began trying to spend as much time as possible out of the house to avoid me. Maybe that's why she didn't come home early that way, the way she said she would on January 6th of 1990. I had been sitting up waiting for her. Lisa's mother was up from Altadena and was staying in the house to watch the kids. She had put Daryl Jr. and Diamond Nicole to bed hours earlier. She was avoiding me, too. I was left to my own devices. I was brooding. Lisa was late. It was after midnight. I, I drank and I, I tried to doze off, but I couldn't. I was, I was angry. Then it was two in the morning and she still wasn't home. I was starting to think dark and ugly thoughts. I was feeling abandoned and angry. The demons were dancing through the fires of my mind. I heard a car pull into the driveway. The automatic garage doors opened. I, I heard the sound of the BMW engine reverberating in the garage. Then the automatic garage door closed with a growl. Then I heard the slam of the beamer's door. It was 3 a.m. I got out of my chair. Lisa came through the door. Was she smiling? You know, despite everything I had said I wanted for myself during the 1990 after I was released from Smithers, I had slipped back into too many old familiar patterns. I had let the pressure of my negotiations with the Mets get to me and sour the decade that I spent in her organization with bad feelings. I let the anger of my family situation again spill over into my professional life, and clearly I had not learned anything I told myself I would learn. I was looking towards February in the opening of Dodger Town in Vero Beach, Florida, where the team would gather and where we'd start playing old rivals in the Grapefruit League. The Mets were on schedule, and I knew I'd be facing them and my friend Dwight Gooden but I still had to find a way to rekindle my spirit, which was flickering after all the bitterness and bad feeling that uh, had built up over the years. My wife and I became estranged again. Uh, You'd be estranged from your family, too, if you had threatened to kill your spouse with a handgun because of a rift between you. Lisa's uncle, Bill Payne, a former Marine and retired LAPD officer, had a suggestion. Why don't you take a few days to think about things in the Mara Cerullo Convention Center out in Anaheim, he said. I had heard of it before, but most Christians in Los Angeles were very, very familiar with the evangelical meetings that uh, Mara Cerullo officiated and preached and with the ways he would heal uh, people's spirits right up there on the podium. You'll learn a lot about uh, what you've been going through and maybe get a chance to talk to people who are looking around for answers the way you are. It was kind of an informal thing. You didn't have to make any commitments or anything, and Bill Payne knew that I was in a lot of difficulty with my life. He suggested that anything I did to put myself into the right groove would help me starting out the new season. No sense, he said, falling right back into the old habits once you're on the Dodgers. Wipe the entire slate clean, he suggested, and change the way you're thinking, maybe. I took him up on it. We made our own kind of pilgrimage to Anaheim. Partly the spiritual convention had the air of a carnival at first. People were greeting friends they knew and making contact over great distances. Partly there was serious business to attend to. Uncle Bill told me the saving of souls. Bill was in dead earnest about what was going to take place. They said, you will learn things about yourself that you never dreamed of. You'll see yourself in a different way. If you're blessed at the end of this, you'll see what it's all about. Maybe I was hoping against hope, but I would eventually get it. Maybe I would get a greater point of all this and and be able to make the breakthrough I'd been uh, trying to make since last season when I came out of Smithers. 
Well, professionally, I was in a different place now, I, I told myself. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could get myself or get something to get me to a different place spiritually? My mother and my sister had become born-again Christians, but as much as I had been claimed to understand the same spiritual truths that had been revealed to them, I was still blind. Maybe now I'd see. There are evil demons, I believe, that were still running through my soul, turning my life inside out. Perhaps here was a way I would find a release. Could I be saved? Well, I spent the first few days in, in a series of classes. Uncle Bill had warned me about this, but I was still a, a little taken aback how serious all this was. There was no partying here, and the gatherings weren't social. I found myself becoming more open to what was going on. I tried to approach the whole thing with an open mind instead of a typical this is all bull attitude that I had approached so many things with in the past. I tried to act like an adult and I knew that I had to be to survive in this environment. I can honestly say that I felt myself beginning to change. I was able to pinpoint the aspects of my life that were negative and even more important, the people talking to me showed me a positive side to myself. I saw how alcoholism and abuse and my sexual promiscuity and my unsympathetic attitudes toward people that created innocent victims. I had to make amends of what I had done. I saw how if I kept living in the world from day to day and believing in the lies of the world, how much further away from the state of grace I would actually be. I resolved to try to find my way towards grace logically, but it wasn't easy. You can't apply logic to this kind of situation. I was really on a kind of pilgrimage. I understood a pilgrimage from a state of confusion and a doubt to a state of revelation and enlightenment. As the week went on, I began to get intimidated by what I was trying to grasp. I was not going to live forever. My life was finite. Actually, life is very short, but the craft of living properly takes a long time to learn. And when you realize that all you occupy in your life is a tiny little spot of earth, you understand your imitation. I became truly weary as I spiritually wandered from place to place in every different session we had. When would the insight come? When would I be able to say about myself that I had a grace with revelation about my own existence, but it still eluded me? My Uncle Bill told me to be patient, that at the end, everything would be clear. But I had begun to doubt even him. Then on a Sunday morning, we gathered for a meeting of or mass in a large auditorium. We were asked to think about the insights we had come to during the previous week and the work we had done on analyzing our own spirits. All of the new visitors, and myself included, were asked if they were ready to receive the Holy Spirit. I looked at my uncle and he simply nodded. But how do I know if I'm ready? I asked him. I know you're ready, he said, and that was all. How did he know if I didn't? But at his urging, pushing actually, and he's a pretty strong guy, he went out into, into the aisles and filed up the line toward the podium. I was kind of embarrassed and along with the others just slouched toward what was everybody was called in the New Jerusalem. Finally, I arrived at the podium and I was led to a spot right before the minister. He put his hands on my head and prayed that I would find salvation and that the power of the Holy Spirit would enter into me. As he prayed, I felt a tingling sensation that I never felt before. I truly didn't know what it was. Then he gripped me tight and called upon the power of the revelation to light me right now. I was suddenly struck as blind as blind could be. I couldn't hear. I, I didn't know where I was for a second. And the force that hit me literally knocked me right off my feet. When I was able to open my eyes and get up, I was welcomed into the world as a new person. When I opened my eyes, I could see as I had never seen before. It was as if I had truly been blind for all my years, but now I had been granted the power of sight. But it wasn't a special kind of sight, insight, a power to see through the trappings of the world and, and deep into the essences of things and people. It wasn't like x-ray vision or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. It was just an ability not to lie to yourself about what you're seeing. I was able to tell the truth to myself for the first time in my life since I was a teenager. I was aware of a sensation of happiness and peace. I had found it, I told myself, and Uncle Bill agreed with me. I still don't know all the answers, don't, still don't even know many of the questions. I only know that I have, have indeed been like the merchant who spent his whole life making bargains. And one day I found this wonderful pearl. It was so valuable because it represented the truth and so completely without flaws that I was willing to give up everything I own just to own it. Maybe the pearl represents salvation. Maybe it represents the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it represents a level of enlightenment that I have now that I didn't have before. Maybe. But it also represents a certain understanding that existence can be flawless if you know what flaws go along with being human and what flaws are almost voluntarily made. I think I can see that now, although I still have a lot to learn. Maybe all of this will make me a better baseball player, too. I hope so. Baseball is the easy part. Living is the hard part. You know, for the Dodgers, the 1991 season was a might-have-been year. 
who began the 91 run for the flag by getting into a quick dogfight with the San Diego Padres for the lead in the West. Things didn't look so good early in the season. By the middle of April, when I was still sweating out my swing and only hitting 179, we were 0-3 against the first-place Padres and hanging on by a fingernails one and a half games behind. Every game was a must just to stay at 500. By the end of April, we were still a game and a half out of first, but now we're in third place behind San Diego and Cincinnati. Atlanta was a game behind us. There were some wild high-scoring games in the beginning of the season before pitches settled down, but Earl Hershiser was on the mend and showing some of the brilliance and dominance he had shown in past years. We promised ourselves we would make our move in May and leave the other teams in the dust. We hadn't yet figured on the Braves. It was still too early. When veterans like Brett Butler, Gary Carter, and I come into a clubhouse and a new team for a first season together, there's bound to be a little bit of feeling out at first. Do you come on strong and really show who you are right away? Do you try to start out as a leader? Do you try to bring bring to your team a piece of what you've had on the other team or look at it totally a new beginning? With a leader like Tommy Lasorda, we took our cues from the way he handles things. Uh, Brett and I each decided uh, on our own thing to the way to hang back in the beginning of the year and not come on too strong until we spent a year in the clubhouse. We also felt we didn't have to be leaders because Tommy Lasorda's style is in the dugout is so aggressive. Another issue that involved Brett and me, as well as Gary Carter and Oral Hershey's, was our spiritual brotherhood. I didn't consider myself an evangelist or a minister, just a believer. I knew about the Baseball Chapel, a ministry of Christians in baseball that's been in operation for about 18 years now. There are a lot of guys who I know and used to play with who are members of the chapel, including Junkman Bob Nepper, Howard Johnson from the Mets, the former San Francisco Giants pitcher Dave Dravecki, and Sid Bream down in Atlanta. With the support of Oral, Brett, and Gary, I joined the chapel, too. Still, I was pretty frustrated. I was swinging too high and too low. I was going after pitches that Little Leaguers would have watched bounce over the plate. I was too worried about showing the hometown fans that Darrell was back and worth every dime of the $20 million they were paying him. I wasn't having fun. I was too busy proving my worth. It was the wrong attitude, and Tommy Lasorda was the first to straighten me out. I don't care if you don't get a hit the whole first half of the season, he said. Take your time. You're going to be here for a while. No one's rushing you to hit back-to-back grand slammers. Well, toward the middle of May, we clawed our way past the Padres into first. San Diego quickly dropped into a third and then fourth, and we found ourselves in a struggle with Cincinnati for the lead in the West. I still didn't have my swing down right, and the fans were hooting that I didn't have the fire in my belly to get the job done. I had the fire all right. I just didn't have the fire water in my belly that sucked me into shooting off my mouth the first chance I got at the end of every game. I just decided to play it cool, work the rust out of my swing, and get used to my new lifestyle. I was playing ball for the rest of my life, I told myself, not just for the game or this season. Then the collision happened. I was running like all get out after a line drive on a Wednesday night when I hit the right field wall. I was really shaking for a moment, and then I felt a blaze of pain. They got me to the hospital where the doctors x-rayed my separated left shoulder. Great. That's my power shoulder. They wanted to put me right on the disabled list, assuming that I wouldn't be ready for weeks, but I fooled them. I was in the starting lineup just two days later. My faith helped me to overcome the pain of the separation, but my shoulder was still weak. I had to sit out a few games and couldn't contribute as much as I wanted to. Well, by early June, we were in first two and a half games over the Braves and nine games over 500, but I still wasn't hitting. I was looking forward to the All-Star break. It had always been a turning point for me in previous years. I had been named to All-Star teams every year since 1984, and I was in 1991 too. But this year, I decided to sit out the All-Star game. Winning the pennant meant more to me than beating the American League. I took the time to make sure the shoulder was healed and I would come back strong. We emerged from the All-Star break smoking, nine and a half games over the third-place Braves and five over Cincinnati. Mike Sosha was still hurt, but Gary Carter, who took his place, had had a 13-game hitting streak. I was hitting only 188 with runners in scoring position, but I knew my time was coming. We were cruising, so somebody asked Mike Sosha in the clubhouse, Hey, Mike, what's the secret of a team's success this year? You guys going to go all the way? The only way we're going to lose this thing, Mike Sosha answered, is if some other team gets flat out hot and plays 650 ball and beats us. Because injuries don't seem to affect us, and slumps don't seem to affect us either. Oh, Mike, statements like that have a terrible way of coming back to haunt you when you least expect them to. I know. And the Tomahawks go chop, 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 chop. Almost two weeks later, we had lost about eight of our last ten games. The Braves are just two and a half games behind us. Was somebody keeping an eye on these Braves? Did anybody notice they were winning all these games without Sid Bream and Dave Justice? 
These guys are hurt sitting in the bench. What's going to happen when they got well? I don't like the looks of things at all. You know, somehow the games of August all seemed to blend together. We didn't play all that badly, but the Braves just kept on winning. And by August 31, they were in first place a game ahead of us. In the early days of September, we were neck and neck. In Atlanta on September 13, we began a three-game series against the division-leading Braves. Fulton County Stadium was hot and crowded. As we were warming up, I, I could see little kids in the stands barely old enough to walk, chopping those tomahawks down at me. Chop, chop, chop. Then... Then the game started and the fans started their Daryl chants. They were so loud and so long, I thought I was back at Shea. Well, they paid for their ducats, so let them make noise and chop as much as they want to. I was there in business, National League business, and they'd soon see what I meant. With the Daryl chants ringing in my ears in my first at bat, I pounded a single to score Brett Butler. When I came up again five innings later, the fans were still on me. Okay, I took Tom Glavin hard and deep for a home run to right that tied the game at two apiece. I single again later and then again for my fourth hit of the night, and we beat the Braves 5-2, to two and we're back in first. Ah, but the next night the Braves beat us then again on the final day of the series. Now we're a one and a half games out with only 18 games remaining. A few days later, Atlanta paid a three-game visit to Dodger Stadium, and this time we won the series and went into the latter part of the September with a one and a half game lead, which we quickly stretched to two when the Braves split a doubleheader with the Reds. I sank into an 11-game slump in the later weeks of the season. I was trying to keep alive, but the weight of the season had begun to drag on all of us. We were playing as individuals now, not as a team. The Dodgers were just hanging on by their fingernails, by a thread. Atlanta was doing much more. Sure, both teams had been in and out of first place in September, but the difference was that the Atlanta players were operating as a team, not just as a bunch of pros, jocks with gym bags who showed up to play, shook hands, and then went home. We won 11 and 14 games, but our lead over the Braves is still just one game. So when we lost our last home game of the regular season to the Padres 9 to 4, and the Braves won their sixth straight beating the Reds, they tied us to first place. We would play our final three games against our longstanding rivals, the Giants, at Candlestick Park, while the Braves would finish up with the last place Astros at home in Atlanta. It seemed as if the Giants wanted to beat us more than the Astros wanted to beat the Braves. On Friday night, October 4, Steve Avery of the Braves no-hit Houston for almost seven innings, and the Braves coasted to a 5-2 win. Well, the game was completed even before hours with the Giants started. Giant pitchers Bud Black and Jeff Brantley shut us down that night, and we lost 4-1. Now we're a game behind with only two to play. The next day, our offense never could get it going. Trevor Wilson shut us out in two hits, and we lost 4 to nothing. The Braves went on and clinched the division by beating the Astros again 5-2. Down the stretch, Atlanta won eight straight crucial games. When our season ended in October, Brett Butler and I talked about what we would do the following year. We knew, even as we watched the Braves in the playoffs, that we had the better team. But we knew that the Braves knew how to play better than we did. We went public. No need to hide our feelings. Next year, we would be back. Next year, we would exert leadership. Next year. Brett and I will be back next year. There'll be some new faces on the ball club, and maybe a, a few old faces will be gone, but Brett and I and now my friend Eric Davis will be there. I've waited years to play in the same team at Davis, and now it's going to happen. With both of us in the outfield, along with Brett Butler, the Dodgers will be unbeatable. Brett, Eric, and I will try to instill a sense of family that I thought was lacking this year. We'll try to show our leadership on the field. We'll try to be the glue that keeps the team together in tight situations. Compare the 92 Dodgers with the 91 Dodgers. You'll see a team that won't give up on itself and that will not have to rely on its key players all of the time. You'll see togetherness and team spirit in the dugout. You'll see a team and not individual guys playing their game and leaving the stadium to go home to the news at 11 to see their pictures on the videotape. So he closed the book on 1991. It would have been a lot easier for the Mets to have simply offered me that fifth year. They really haven't replaced me. Now Eric is back in Los Angeles. Now Brett and I are going to make a spiritual difference on the Dodgers. Now things are going to happen that will really make 1992 a year of fireworks all over the National League wherever the Dodgers play. No, the Mets ain't seen nothing yet. We hope you have enjoyed Daryl as read by the author Art Russ Jr. High Top Sports has an ever-increasing audio library for your listening enjoyment. High Top Sports tapes can be purchased at your favorite retail book outlets.